what nobody else wants to do is be a publisher. Oh, okay. It, there's no glory in being a publisher. Okay. It just looks good in the masthead, and it kind of makes me feel important because <laughs> I'm just glad there are a lot of pictures in the magazine. Helps me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. Welcome to Oil & Whiskey, an Ironclad Original. I am Josh Henning. I'm Phil Gerber. I'm Jeremy Gerber. Welcome to Oil & Whiskey, an Ironclad Original, presented by Blade HQ. Today we're going to be talking with Tim Foss, publisher for In the Garage Media. But before we get to the interview, we have another On the Gas segment. It, it, it's nice when we have guests to pick their brain about who's on the gas. I mean, nobody would be better suited for it than you, Tim, who is out and about and in all these shops and in all these shows. So fire away. What do you got? <laughs> At least once a week, I get together with our editors of Classic Truck Performance, Modern Rotting, and All Chevy Performance, and they pretty much let me know who's on the gas. That's how I learned. <laughs> okay. a cheat sheet there. <laughs> That's it. Oh, yeah, I think you, you had a pretty good poll, um, someone that me and Josh have, uh, have noticed for a while. Um, give us the quick rundown on your experience with this shop, and then we'll kind of take it from there. Well, I, I met Bill Ganahl years ago when he worked for <clears throat> Roy Brizio, and just a stand-up guy. Um, we do a lot of work with him. Recently run a shop tour in Classic Truck Performance. Um, shot a couple of vehicles of his for Modern Rotting and Classic Truck Performance. I think he's at least got one of our covers. Nice. You know, me and Josh saw they did a absolutely killer 57 real kind of subtle gasser um, probably three years ago at uh, the Grand National Roadster Show. I think we've both been pretty enamored with that car ever since. And I'm mean, just cruising their Instagram. They got a lot of, a lot of cool stuff, very tasteful, very subtle Seems like he's just nailing the style. I think just really good yeah. is the best way to describe it. That I can't get past the riv. That riv is just done like absolutely perfect. The color too, I'm sure that was probably something I'm guessing he had that had to have had that in his mind and wasn't giving up. From the, because yeah, from that, the start. Yeah, that took, that's a tough sell to the customer a tough initially. Sell, but but that is so perfect. And you know, with the panel paint on the roof. I know that's one that we've recently shot for modern rotting. Which is that, the RIV? The RIV, yeah. Nice. Yeah, that'll be a good feature. Yeah, that's a hell of a lineup there. South City Rod and Custom. Like you said, uh, that's somebody that, I mean, we already know the backstory a little bit, but you can tell that they've been in, in the scene, not trying to build to a scene. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Some of that shit right there you can't, you can't fake. You either know it and, and been in it, from the colors of the stance. I mean, you, that, that whole, this was the shit when, you know, growing up, I mean, I know we have a new magazine here, but back in the day, Rod and Custom, I mean, this was, you, you know that well, Tim. Well, Bill's father was the editor of Rod and Custom for years and a huge historian in the marketplace. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with him many times. Yeah, check him out. South City Rod and Custom. Lots of good ideas on there. Absolutely. Lots of good ideas. <laughs> I was looking at, as you were thumbing through that, that under dash panel with the AC vents. Oh, was yeah. On that C10. I mean, again, just yeah, a really subtle, good looking. subtle little piece that's just perfectly executed. Nice stuff. Really cool stuff. Tim Voss is the publisher for In the Garage Media, who distribute all Chevy performance, classic truck performance, and modern rotting magazines. Tim helped create In the Garage Media a little over two years ago and brought with him over 30 years of personal experience. That's 30 years. That's where that gray hair comes from. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at, his, at this past year's SEMA show, the In the Garage Media was named 2021 Hot Rod Industry Alliance Business of the Year. Congratulations. Thanks. It's quite an honor. Yeah, that is. That's a hell of an honor. Right out of the gate, too. I mean, you guys haven't been at it. Oh, you've been at it for an awful long time, but In the Garage <laughs> Media is... <laughs> <laughs> pretty fresh uh, to learn cool. more about their content and others other stuff they offer visit in the garage media's website at in the garage media.com and on instagram at classic underscore truck underscore performance and at modern rotting 
Tim Foss, welcome to Oil and Whiskey. Welcome, Thank Tim. you. It's quite an honor. It's great to have you. Honor to have you here. Yeah, we've uh, you know we go way back. I think I I met you before. I was an employee of the Roadster Shop. I don't know if you even remember that because oh, I was just a young little whippersnapper <laughs> making frame rails. Grinding around the corner. I sure enjoyed watching the 32 frame rails being built by you. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> that was like one of one of my fondest memories, I think, because at the time, you don't realize but it's what you've done your whole career, but how like much of a, you know, you hold that to such a high level, the magazines. And being just a young fabricator, it was like God walked in to the shop. And then we got to go out to dinner and went to Texas Roadhouse, you know, which was... Did you get a blooming sure. onion? I think I did get a blooming <laughs> onion. But man, it was just like, that was such a cool, cool experience. I'll never forget it. I thought that was, I had, I had like made it. I had arrived on the scene. I was breaking bread with the magazine with guys the magazine at dude. Texas Roadhouse. <laughs> well, it wasn't much... Long, much after that, I think probably six months, and you owned the company. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that was a, a quick progression there. Yeah, I, it was interesting because I knew Bill for many, many years, and I mean, Roadster Shop was a good sized company, and then after Bill went through his divorce, it really, really shrunk the company. I think he didn't want to pay out. What, <laughs> what yeah, <money>. yeah. He, <laughs> Probably customers didn't want to pay in either. After dealing with <laughs> I think it was a little bit everything. You know, he wasn't a whiskey guy, but the story is is that he did enjoy his martinis. Okay, quite a bit, <laughs> maybe more than he should have. So, yeah, I, but it was a big, big deal at one point. I mean, you remember it better than anybody. But back well, in the mid '80s, yeah, and I met him. Actually, I worked for TCI the first time I met him, and. Uh, it's really interesting getting a chance to meet Bill, and we became great friends after that, and which is how I had the opportunity to meet you before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then, before the magazine, I met you as a magazine guy, but I know you know I've known you for a long time, and I know about the TCI uh, heritage. But I can't believe we let him in the door. <laughs> yeah, is it, well, I guess it's, it's long enough got, removed yeah. now. <laughs> it's been probably thirty-five years somewhere okay. on there. <laughs> so where did the whole hot rod thing start for you? Where did it come from? When did you get when did you get your start? Well, I, I I think I fell in love with engines when I got my first Honda fifty. Ooh. And I was six years old and, and from there on I just anything with a motor I absolutely loved. Is that like a Z fifty or what what are we looking at back in that era? Little trail fifty. There sixty nine would have been I think Yeah. It's a, mini, it's a mini trail, Honda Mini Trail. Yeah, stamp tanks and yeah, they're worth a lot. Before it got into yeah. plastic, <laughs> it's a five thousand dollar <laughs> mini bike now. <laughs> it, well, by the time I was done with it, it wasn't worth much. But <laughs> I don't think you could have made it into a five thousand dollar mini bike. <laughs> but that you know, really having an engine and seeing what it could do got me interested in cars and trucks. And I think MTV actually is what turned me on to street rods. Really, the old ZZ Top video, the Eliminator Coupe. I really never, growing up in Yuma, Arizona, there was a lot of restored cars, but there weren't any hot rods. I think there was a couple of, there, I saw maybe two hot rods, and then I ended up being lucky enough to go to Bass Lake over, I believe it was Memorial Day weekend, when all the Hells Angels showed up. We were the only ones in the campground besides the Hells Angels, and if you knew my background and my parents were quite religious, yeah, it was kind of an interesting weekend. But <laughs> I saw a tea bucket there and thought that was pretty cool. But I think in the early 80s when MTV came out, I showed my dad the Eliminator Coupe and kind of spurred him because he was an old hot rodder and when he was a kid and th had 32s, 34s. And so I'd, after that, we went to a rod run and I kind of gave up on Porsches and decided that it was... I really wanted to have a three window coupe. That was that video was was definitely it was like a a window into what you thought was possible if you had a street run. <laughs> that yeah. might have been the reason. Yeah. <laughs> it's never actually the case, it, though, is it? No, no. It's, yeah. it's usually all the other guys that saw the same video that are super <laughs> interested in your car. <laughs> I hate to say it, I've never seen the video. Oh wow! Really? Yeah, I'm familiar with the car. 
and I'm familiar with the album cover, but never seen the video. Well, there were several with that particular car. It yeah. was just so iconic and, you know, toured around, I believe Jack Chisenhall had something to do with it, touring the different ZZ Top cars. I'm not sure exactly on the Eliminator Coupe. I think um, <laughs> that one was toured around. They they had made a couple different ones. Yeah. And the rumor is that one of them was stolen and nobody knows which one. But hmm. It's my memories of ZZ Top or Billy Gibbon, they started with him riding around the good guy shows and Paul Atkins, was that a 48 Ford or something, that convertible? Yeah. yeah. That's out of a million miles on it. Yeah. yeah. Is that a fiberglass car? Yeah. Cool. This looks like a home video. <laughs> so this is this the one. cutting that, edge back in the day. Yeah, this is the one that got it started. Yeah. Okay. This <laughs> Does it make sense? This is the car, for yeah. sure. Right? This was, you got to understand, this was uh, like that era's. Uh, it was like before the uh, Tawny Katane videos. White before Snake. the Roaster Shot okay. videos. <laughs> gotcha, <Yeah>. gotcha. <laughs> All right, I'm seeing it now. Like weird science, but okay. yeah, that yeah, era. Gotcha. Yeah. Good stuff. So that's really what, interested me in, in hot rodding and wanted to be involved. Went to a rod run and started about a 34 Ford pickup that my dad and I actually painted the frame and did, I did a lot of the body work on it. Um, it was okay. Yeah. It certainly wasn't anything <laughs> like you guys build, but it was, it was a lot of fun. Nice. And I bought a 34 sedan after that and ended up building it for my dad. My brother still owns that one. It's been around since like 86. What were you doing for a living through all of this? Well, when I started, I was in college and I worked at a hot rod shop, Unique Auto Parts, a real small shop. I think I was hired to sweep the floors. I learned a lot of things, how to, how to build windows for a chopped car. Um, We've templates. had more success stories about starting sweeping the floors than I think really starting anything else. Yeah. Everybody, I mean, it's amazing the guys that we talk to from other shops, even, I mean, you and your industry and your profession, I mean, guys that work here, I mean, the, the success stories of, I started sweeping the floors, you know, I did, I started sweeping the floors, went into a shop, and bullshitted about what I could do and started sweeping the floors. I mean, there's, there's something to be said for it. Some of our top guys here at the Roadster shop. Yeah, started top chassis builders are started, started off uh, doing just that. I mean, Blake and you know, our parts <clears> manager, <throat> that's a guy, if you would have seen the way that this guy would swept the floors and clean stuff, there's no wonder he's in a management role now. I mean, it was just worked his ass off to do it and do it really well. And it, it was the cleanest of, the shop ever was. Yeah. I can't believe we let him kind of step up. <laughs> yeah, we should have just, just left him there. But it is amazing, though, <laughs> in all seriousness, what, like you said, what you can pick up along the way even without just the hands-on, but pick up along the way. I mean, from the shop culture and, I mean, the morale and who's doing what and where things are. I mean, you can, you know, when you do get into a position of doing something, you can, you know, it's it's a little bit easier than just coming in off the street and start trying to fit in. You know, you've, it's a... You're kind of lurking in the shadows for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, paying attention and watching, if you're paying attention yeah. and watching. Yeah, it was a very neat experience to kind of do that from the beginning and learn a lot about hot rods and and in my next job I was um, dressed down my first day of work because I didn't know exactly how a four link worked and had some pretty tough questions that first day but other than that it was it's been a good really good experience so you you're, you're building street rods you're working at a, a hot rod shop you built one for your dad where's the, the the progression go from there where do you start realizing that you know there's more out there. I want to do this. I mean, tell, take us, take us through it. We got all night, man. We just poured the first <laughs> glass of whiskey. Well, I, you know, I, I knew I wanted to be a part of the industry and the magazine side really interested me a lot. I knew I met Tom Vogley and he was the editor of street router at the time. And he and I became good friends. And so I interviewed there for about a year, but they hired a couple of people in between me 
And uh, so I got the opportunity to ride home with the president of the company and from SEMA one year and talked to him about a lot of different things. And he found out I went to Cal Poly Pomona and graduated, which was his alma, alma mater, <laughs> or however you say that. What year, what year <laughs> yeah, is this? Would have been, uh, I graduated in 90. I was a, kind of what they would call a late bloomer. I, I went to college long enough to become a doctor and became a salesman. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I had to get serious about work because I had a, had a young baby. And so I, I found the magazine business and, and uh, I really have enjoyed that ever since. Started as a salesman and ended up being the publisher of over 50 magazines during, during my career. Um, so, but my true love is street rods, classic trucks is probably my first love. And, uh, obviously Chevy's are, are a big part. And when we decided to start our company, that's the avenues that we went and we were really lucky to have Rob Fortier, who'd been a staffer on actually been the editor of classic trucks. Um, Brian Brennan, who was the editor of street rotter and Nick Licata was the editor of Chevy high performance. So I started out with the top notch editorial staff and Yasmeen, who I can't, I, I couldn't have done it without her. She obviously had to come. <laughs> so, but it was kind of neat during the timing. We all kind of found ourselves needing a job. Sure. And, uh, Sarah Gonzalez, who was our managing editor came with us. And so it rounded out really well. And we actually got our art director from Lowrider hmm. and Rob Munoz. That's cool. I think the one thing that is very intriguing to me and probably a question that everybody has out there because you're talking about, you know, starting your company and there's a reason for that. Obviously you didn't just go paywall and decide that I'm leaving the magazine and going to start my own magazine. <laughs> there was kind of a, an event that you can't blow over that. It was, pivot, it was, <laughs> I mean, it was pivotal. <laughs> In the more whole industry, in the it, whole entire industry, not, well, it, not it, just you. Yeah, it felt like, you know, for the advertisers and for the hot rod shops and everybody in the industry, mm. you know, it was almost like like Armageddon. Or is this the end of the hot rod industry? All of it's like, what the hell? What are we going to do? Street riders gone. I mean, who, who all f like it was what nine in one lost. day or it was more? No, no, it, was, it was, I think it was 19. Super Chevy, Street Rodder. And then prior to that, we were popular hot rodding was wiped. And then Rod and Custom. Rod and Custom was a great magazine. And that was. Well, you know, the, <sighs> just go, the, hard, the hard thing about when you get a, a, a high level senior management team, they, they don't always see things that you see that are really obvious. When we had Rod and Custom and we had a separate sales staff for Rod and Custom, it flourished. When we had a separate staff on street rotter it flourished you can't you can't effectively sell two competitive magazines at the same time it's very difficult because you know one of them is obviously going to be dominant mm -hmm. and so everybody jumps i mean i i've been with the company when when we purchased muscle mustang our mustang magazine was dead the next week there there were no ads nothing to come in yeah and so anyway, there was a decision made um, by the Motor Trend Group and uh, Discovery Channel to shut down the magazines because that wasn't the direction that they were going to go. And they did keep three super sites, which were uh, off um, Four Wheeler, Motor Trend, and Hot Rod, which did, were doing very well. And now since they've combined those all into the, to the motor trend site, but I would have, you know, that's a place I would have never left. I, I absolutely sure. loved working there and, but there was, it, the timing was just so excellent to go do it ourselves. You know, just yeah. it, it, you know, it was right at, nobody had figured out until SEMA that it was ha happening. I found out the day before SEMA. And so I was told to go sell, like nothing was going to go on. And then three weeks later, whatever it was, we, shut everything down. And I was, I stayed on until January till we finished out the end of January and, and March, March 1st, we started this company. 
I guess it would have been, I think the third, but I was at the sand dunes looking forward to my new, di- my new gig the next day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had dinner at uh, SEMA. We sat down and you broke us the news and you know, almost like shed a tear. It was the end of an era. I did. And it was, a couple. <laughs> yeah, it was, but you, it, nobody had any idea what the future held at that point, but I'm assuming the wheels had to be immediately turning for you. I mean, you've always yeah. been, you've always been the guy I've looked at the magazines. I mean, I don't always understand the titles of publisher, no oh, publisher, this and that, but that. I'm like, I always just figured Tim's the fucking guy, right? Tim's the guy <laughs> at the magazine. So what's going to happen next? And well, it was, it is. yeah, it was, it was one of those things where you, I didn't expect to have to do this, you know, I, I, and again, I don't mean have to, I didn't expect to get the opportunity to because sure. there was no way you were going to compete against the magazine brands that were out there. But there were certainly a lot of people left who wanted magazines. And I believe my dinner with you, you told me, I, I think I talked to you about maybe doing a digital magazine and you go, oh, no, you guys need to do print. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think So we I, did both. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm usually not the best guy to talk to about that because I might be... 39 years old, but I operate electronics and digital things like I'm 139. <laughs> I was going to say like 80. I was trying to fall somewhere. If you could figure out how to put yeah. your uh, magazine in a, in a telegraph, like you can get it on the, the old school, like, you know, and put it or put it in like a bottle and float it. <laughs> over to me. I just, I struggle with the, and sorry, I don't mean any disrespect, but the shh, shh, Thing, you know, on the, the fake, the fake turning yeah. of the page. It's just, um, you know, it's just not for me. I don't, it's not. I'm turn just, the volume down. <laughs> <laughs> Mute it. Well, you have to look at ours. Yeah. Ours is a little more digital format. You, you know, where you scroll upwards, it's sure probably a little easier to, there's no, yeah. <laughs> it is. It is. we do have some video on there so you can Good. see some of that. But other than that, no, <laughs> not to bounce around too much, but it was a great segue there by Jeremy. I, uh, I am very, uh, I guess, dumb when it comes to magazine uh, employee titles. So obviously sales, understood. You're selling ads in the magazine. You know, Editor makes a little bit of sense. I don't really know what they're doing, but they're probably editing, something they're to editing, do with editing, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. The publisher title, like what does the publisher do? When you go from sales to publisher, what what is? like? Well, in, in a lot of cases through the years, it's just been a glorified salesperson. Okay. And... And, and the role that I'm in now, and I've been at, in a, other companies, you spend the time to make sure the books look good, make sure, you know, kind of keep an eye on what's going on with the editorial. I mean, we've got very qualified editors, but you always want to take care of the people who are taking care of you. Like a and producer then, in a way? It's kind of everything but writing. Okay. They don't let me write anything. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Although I did have my first story published with Rob. Fortier gave me some latitude to, to write a story about one of my trucks that I've had since I, or got when I was 14. Um, so that was kind of fun. But uh, after that, no one's asked for any assistance in that. <laughs> yeah, 35 years probably, in the making. I figure you're just super busy. They don't want to bother you with that. You've I got to understand, I too, that sometimes it's just people trying to keep you down. Phil doesn't want us to do any more jingles, but we've heard through the grapevine that the jingles are really pretty good. Um, so we're going to continue. We're going to continue doing the jingle. So keep writing. Don't let anybody tell you. Clip your wings. <laughs> I don't know. It always ends up in this. You know, we'll run it next month. So, hmm. but no, we have very. I mean, I mean, I've worked with Rob for, I think, close to thir- twenty-seven years. I think, and uh, he had left for a while, and then came back, and then again when we started this, he came came aboard and. Brian Brennan, I think 25, and Yasmin over 20. And so, and Nick, I think it was 18. Nick Licata. Yeah. Yeah, Nick's a good dude. There's a lot of great people that we met. Some great people, some may, maybe not so great, but most of them were phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal right. people in the magazine. I always, I mean, I remember I still keep in touch with you know, Joe Road, and Joe's had a. Joe's a great guy. Yeah, Joe's a solid dude. He was actually just texting me when you showed up to bust your balls a little bit. So <laughs> yeah, we'll well, get there. Oh, we should have some dirt. <laughs> Joe was really a great hire for me. So yeah. eat that, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, solid guy. But yeah, it was a great team. Back yeah. then. And a lot Janine, of them, maybe not so much. Oh, come on now, Phil. 
Phil's Janine was Phil's just awesome. saying Phil's just saying it because he doesn't want his wife to find out about like you know, his side <laughs> action that he had going on over there. Um, she was more demanding than my wife. Yeah. <laughs> Well, as she should be. Yeah, yeah, she, she needed that ad. She, yeah, she's yeah. trying to get the sale. <laughs> yeah, whatever she, it takes. Yeah. Right? The uh, <laughs> going back, going back in time a little bit. Where, where do you think that? I probably you probably didn't notice it then, or maybe you did. Um, in the historic, old school magazine days, we had this many titles. We were running it this way. When did people start noticing a change or a direction of something? Because it. I don't think it happened overnight. I mean, and it wasn't when the internet was invented. It wasn't in that when did, when did stuff start changing where everybody started kind of ears poking up? Like, we, well, I think what's it, going on as soon as you're bought out by a large corporation or investment group, it seems like one of the first things they try to do is find synergy. And like I said, when you lose half your salespeople and you're put into a situation where you, where you're selling, two competitive magazines and somebody goes, why don't I just run a spread in this one and not run that one? The salesperson doesn't care. You know, the volume in some cases, they were actually making more money because of, because of that. And I really feel that, and then you lose control of what you get to write about. Um, in the, in the later part, you know, what, what goes on online isn't always what's popular to a print reader. So if this article did really well online and you have to, you know, kind of, Oh, well, we need to do more of these articles by somebody who has no clue that that was a one-time hit. Sure. So I, I, I think that, you know, through all the years, I, I think the best way to say it is, is mismanagement is what really brought, brought the house down. Where do you see uh, your customers as a whole consuming media now differently than they might have before? And I know this sounds like a very stupid question. We, everybody's heard the interviews and podcasts and TV and other stuff. Everybody keeps saying, well, people are consuming media differently. They're always consuming it digitally. They don't want print. They don't want print. I get that, that that's the thing that's been said. But I don't know if that's always the case. To your, to your point right now, you're still a paper guy. As modern as you are on some other things, you're still a paper guy. There's other guys that would con that would seem to be older and would be in your camp that are not, that consume everything yeah. digitally, you know, that are I uh my father in law, I mean, close to seventy years old, he's mid sixties, and that's he's not gonna look at a newspaper or a magazine. If it's not on his iPad, he's not gonna read it, look at it, or get any of that information. So I don't think it's as simple, at least in this industry, as just saying it's got to be online or it's got to be everybody's consuming things differently and not just in certain camps. I, I agree that, I mean, there's so much more out there than there was when we started, when we started at, when I started at the company, we didn't have computers. Everything was handwritten. We actually had paste up, you know, there was no computers. There was a typesetter <laughs> and so it was, it was a lot different. I mean, digital photography changed everything. Yeah. I remember we went the, out, had to be early 2000s, and over everybody's stall was just rolls of film. And, yeah. and, and they like were, two years later, that was just gone. And yeah. then somebody mentioned it. We went out there. Remember we were hanging out with Chris Shelton? Yeah. And I think he's walking us through there, and he's like, yeah, they're talking about, like, this is all going to go, like, to digital. We're like, that's... Okay, like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I think that one of the things you'll see is the size of our market has changed a lot because of the different outlets that we have nowadays, Through whether it's through a podcast, whether it's, you know, YouTube, whether it's Facebook. I think there's a lot of different outlets. If you can hook someone, does it really matter where you hook them? And I think especially for companies like yours, one of the best things in the world is to see a chassis company doing well, seeing the industry do well when it comes to chassis, because that is the foundation of every project. And if you don't, if the chassis sales suck, it's only a matter of time. Yeah. Till everything else is going to suck. <laughs> That's an interesting way of looking at it. That's the way I always look yeah. at it. I mean, we always looked at, you know, how healthy is the chassis suspension market? Sure. If that's healthy, I mean, we got another 10 years 
you know, because it, yeah. it takes all the guys to build through the rest of their car. They got to <laughs> exactly. buy, they got to buy seats and motors yeah, and steering have, wheels afterwards. I, we might only be have gauge advertisers at some point, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it really was it. You know, you really always did. We always did, or I always did by the foundation of the vehicle. That's, that's, that's interesting. interesting. I never really thought about it that way, but that is, uh, it makes me feel kind of good that we're like the, we're the gauge. I it's, guess the gauge. It is, it, it is true. I mean, well, I, so you really don't care what the polishes and wax companies doing. That's the last <laughs> line. It's, it's the very end. <laughs> I think they're too busy chasing formula one to worry about <laughs> yeah. us anymore. <laughs> the, um, it is interesting, though, for you to be in the industry for so long. We've we've been in it for a long time, um, but from the outside looking in. But if you sit back and think, like, for 30 years prior to the mid-2000s, there wasn't a lot of innovation or changes. Like you said, you had you know had digital cameras come along. You had stuff like that. But you, you were still putting out a paper magazine, right. you know? And that was really the only thing that anybody could get in that information. So iPhone was what, mid-2000s, 2005, 2006? Sounds about right. Yeah, ish. Somewhere, Somewhere there. around there. So that was, there wasn't, a, there wasn't like a slow progression through that. You know, you had flip phones that you could text and maybe send a really grainy JPEG of something. And the next day, you've got a little computer you know, small computer that you could look log at anything, onto MySpace. anything that you want to look at, you know, so that, and there wasn't really like a ramp up of like, okay, well you could get like low quality pictures on this phone or something like that. Or then you could get a little bit better quality. It was nothing. And then everything. And then I don't even think anybody in the industry really realized then that people were going to look at like pictures of cars or anything else. It was just, Oh, now I can see, you know, a picture of my kids that my wife texted me or whatever. It, that was, it's a very quick thing, but that's also been close to 20 years. Yeah. You know, you, you look at it, though, and one of the things that I'll, I'll always say is you don't ever hear about somebody bragging about their car being on YouTube. Yep. Because I can do that. But to get your car in the magazine for someone is like one of the most, I mean, I know it because every day I've got somebody ordering 20, 30 ma ba um, yeah. issues with their car in yeah. it. And so I think that that's one of the areas where, and, and, and also talking to our customers, I mean, they save them forever. Yep. And I didn't want to tell them about this new thing called the internet that you can, <laughs> <laughs> you can probably go back and find every article. Yeah. Yeah, but what are you going to do? Like frame your iPad, you know, or print out a picture sure. and frame it. That's not the same. Yeah. That was, uh, that was something I was going to bring up because there is, there's no better feeling. You can't replace that of that, feeling of seeing your creation in a magazine or on the cover on of a magazine. Cover. I mean, the 12 a year, right? The cover shot that I don't care. Yeah. Like you said, you could put it on YouTube, Instagram, whatever, you know, stream it to the whole world. But unless it's physically on the cover of a magazine, I don't think it gets any cooler than that. I don't think it ever will. No, it won't. It go. It's, it's like it's stamped in history and it's, uh, there's the, there's the feeling of it. it's permanent. Like yeah. it'll be forever there. If it's on the internet, I mean, it could get deleted or wiped out or scroll past it. Is yeah, it's the permanent. I thought you had, you had a situation with that, though, didn't you? You were worried about that stuff being permanent that posted on the internet. <laughs> yeah, you can <laughs> you can pay a certain amount of money. They'll like they'll, and then they'll take it down. Yeah, they'll explain. Who do you write the check to? Like, could you, you, yeah, could you tell us how to do you call? There's, <laughs> there's private services that you okay. have to hire Just for that. Google, like all Google. No, no Google. Okay. No, you have to hire a guy that specializes in that. Too. Okay. Out of all the fucking people you want to talk about <laughs> cleaning somebody's <laughs> history. <laughs> His search history is dangerous. Yeah. You just posted things. Hey, moving on. <laughs> just going to let the listeners yeah. decide what those were and maybe Google it and try to find them. I don't know. I don't even know what y'all are talking about. I don't know if I do either. <laughs> yeah, neither do I. But I think there's a few things what we were talking about is, you <laughs> yeah. know, magazine covers, things right. like that. But I think there's a few things, in my opinion, that uh, are irreplaceable that need, it kind of sort of need to be in print. Like, I've always felt, number one, being on the cover of a magazine, that's awesome. There's nothing that replaces that. But I also have always felt that the, like, the validation of advertising in a magazine for a company that that's something, you know, you don't see a lot of fly by night 
companies just randomly pop up in the magazines with an ad. You know, it's generally it's somebody that's they're bringing their A game. They've come to play. They're a, a legitimate company that has gone the extra mile to actually physically advertise. Whereas the internet's made that pretty easy. Yeah, now just, you can snap a picture and post it in two seconds, but yeah, you had to have a graphic designer, a photographer, uh, piece all that stuff together. Careful. This, not necessarily. This is still the hot rod industry. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, there, there's a level of I can't imagine being on the sales it. side of things of when you'd like, guys are like, yeah, I want to do an ad. Absolutely. All right, well, send me over your ad. All right, talk, yeah, to, well, us, how, talk, talk to us <laughs> about that one. Here's my logo. <laughs> <laughs> can you, what can you do for me? Give us a story on that one. And that's not uh, a bad thing because, I mean, you, we've all been in this for a long time. We're, we're been in the industry either building hot rods, muscle cars, products for those. We're not in the graphic design business. You know, a lot of people don't hire or staff the type of people that it would take to make an ad like that. So I'm sure they leaned on you guys a lot to do that. You know, I've always found the best thing is to recommend somebody else. And, and I, <laughs> and I don't mean that in a bad way. I think our art director, Rob Munoz is, is excellent. We do a couple of ads in the magazine for other people. They look very good. I'm in, and I know that we fight this a lot with you guys, yeah. <laughs> but I think that an ad that shows a lot of product really helps yep. to seal the deal versus an image ad. Yep. I still believe that. I will always believe that, but there's a lot of people that, you know, really want to show their image. And I think there's certain companies in this industry that are, that can do that. I think you've done a good job of, of the image ad but I always like to have something that you can actually feel the physical sale oh, yeah. from. Yeah, I think yeah, you're putting a Mark Campbell street and performance catalog <laughs> in and as an ad is a little in a quarter bit much. In a quarter, yeah. in a quarter page is there's kind a of sweet, tough. There's a sweet spot. You know, I think you brought us back to center. You know, we went like to the point where we thought maybe we were like BMW and you could just throw some, you know, cool beautiful driving image shot up and... there with a the little Roadster Shop logo and it's going to result in sales. Well, and it probably didn't. Maybe your new campaign might work for. <laughs> yeah, we're trying, we're trying to do different things now. You know, they say sex sells, I guess. So you know, we've you know, rolled out some videos that I think check us out, Roadster Shop on Instagram. White snake, <laughs> white snake, <laughs> boobs, <laughs> all sorts of. But uh, yeah, that uh, we you were definitely I think instrumental in guiding us through that to where the image ads versus the product ads. And we found a, I think we found a kind of a happy medium there of a yeah. blend of image and, and product where it doesn't well, necessarily look like a JC Whitney catalog. No, I agree. I think that being able to show all the lines in, in one ad is great because it does show the progression. A lot of that has to do with the individual magazine itself too. So you can kind of pick up on the, on the readership of, you know, what they would react to more than others. I don't think there's a one size fits all ad across all magazines, you know, in the auto, my personal opinion, I think everybody's got, I mean, a, what you're going to do in a classic trucks, you know, is probably a little different than what you're going to do in a, you know, modern rotting or something like that. And yeah, we used to always struggle with that. Like, Oh, this is more of a DIY. We'll do like cross members and bolt in parts. And then like this one's more of the high end. We'll do the independent rear big dollar. Yeah. You know, it might not be but, that way, but it may be yeah, in, in your head. head. Yeah. yeah. But as far as building ads, I think it's, for me, I think the hardest part is being a middleman between a customer of mine and, an, and a graphic designer. Like I said, Rob does nice ads, but there's a lot of graphic designers that doing an ad for them is beneath what, what they really want to do. Sure. And what think, are some, some of the companies back in history that you've seen that have some of the worst ads? Yeah, I feel like he, 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 he totally <laughs> dodged is, the question where, where, I was, where I was trying to go with it. Right. I wanted the you know, war story of... What? There used to be a company called Michael Thomas. Like the hair products? No. Is that, is that Paul was, Mitchell. No, there's another one. I think it was Michael Thomas, but they, they, made, they made a salon. weld to, together Mustang II front end. Okay. And it all came in pieces. And they laid it all out, but it didn't really look like a Mustang too. I mean, you could tell the cross member in that, but sure. it was, I think that one was pretty bad. Um, Who, Sue, 
Out of people that are advertising with you right now, who's got some? <laughs> <laughs> I think they all look great. <laughs> and I, and I, Keep you know, shooting it's, that shot one day, <laughs> one day. But I, I got to say though that you know, with one of the things that makes it better for everyone is when you look at our paper, you can actually the images look correct, and it's one thing I had to apologize a lot when people had really good looking ads. Yeah. before is yeah. is the wash through the paper and that makes a huge difference to to me towards the end there it kind of got to be like almost tissue paper like you were afraid to to rip the magazine turn in the page at the old magazine. at the old place yeah i don't know we have a we have a competitor in the truck market that's downgraded their paper pretty well too so you can cut that out. Yeah. <laughs> or not. Yeah, we did. <laughs> Street truck. Yeah, we did feel. <laughs> uh, we did feel there, like, towards the end, yeah, the magazine started getting thinner, lighter. You'd tear them as you're flipping pages, and it was, the writing was kind of on the wall a little bit. That, and then they complain about, why don't people want to? Ever do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, too, you know, with us, we always use a poly bag to get it there. And so I think that also helps in the quality because I can guarantee you when somebody gets one out of the poly bag or has a bend in the page, we're sending them a new one. Before we transition into some other industry stuff, uh, staying on the magazine track, uh, who do you know at grassroots motorsports, uh, that could potentially do some. I know where you're, I know where you're going with this one. <laughs> featuring a Phil's. Miata? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think that's a market that you right. intend to explore, right? I don't think there's going to be like a, what would you even call that? Like compact sports roads? What, what, is, what do you classify one of those as? Roadster shop. Roadsters. Roadsters. Miatas. Yeah. Roadsters, okay. Roadster shop Miata? At, at, Gentleman's <laughs> race car. At any rate, I don't think it doesn't fit. In the garage media. Yeah. So you're you can fit several of them have, in the garage though. You've got have to have some contacts at like an email address or something. Yeah. We're trying to get Phil's car featured or maybe do a cover for his <laughs> birthday or something. We talked about how important that is, like how much it means to have a car right. in the magazine, right? Like yeah. when I was a kid, my I set my goals towards readers' rides. If I could get something in a readers' rides, I mean that was next level. Yeah, you're in the magazine. Right. Which I think Phil would be probably fine with that at his level of, you know. Miata fabrication. So that's a I'm no. You don't know yeah. anybody there. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Next. See. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to affect. He, I know he writes the checks about, for the ads. It's just it's a, fine. It's what if we do a trade? You guys can do jingles, but then we eliminate the Miata talk. Which would you pick? Yeah. I'm going to give up the jingles. I could give up the jingles right now. Really? Yeah, for, in favor of, in lieu of talking about Miatas. I think a new yeah. magazine, Miata Monthly, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Miata get, Swap, like to see what people put in Miatas. Give me the picture. I can make. I can get you a cover. Okay. Yes, we've got. I got to get the Miata first. <laughs> what, did you just get it out of the garage. What are you, what are you talking <laughs> about? It's, get it. You just got to go home. I mean, it's, <laughs> we'll wait. <laughs> I mean, you live 15 minutes from here. It's not that big of a deal. <sighs> I get you don't want to put a lot of street miles on it, but. They're race tires. <laughs> uh, so as a magazine publisher, you've kind of explained like publishing and how that works. I still don't understand it, but we'll just go with it. The uh, <laughs> It's what what nobody else wants to do is be a publisher. Oh, okay. It, there's no glory in being a publisher. Okay. It just looks good in the masthead, and it kind of makes me feel important because <laughs> I'm just glad there are a lot of pictures in the magazine. Helps me. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm right there with you. Uh, talk about SEMA a little bit and how instrumental it has been and how instrumental it is uh, to today with uh, in the garage media, um, and a little bit about that. We've had we had a great guest on. Um, it's may or may not have already been aired when this episode comes out. Um, you know, talking about the show and um, stuff. You know, Tom Tom Gattuso. Um, it was a really good episode and talked a, bit, a little bit about putting on the show. But from your perspective, you know, you're not you're not building a product. You're not building cars. You're going there to get the content, you know, to your membership and to stuff like that. So that's a different aspect, something we're not we're not used to at all. So talk us through a little bit about how 
that works. I think from our standpoint, from a magazine standpoint, you want to see what the new products are. You want to get the jump on everybody else. You want to make sure the readers get to see them. There's a lot of really cool stuff that comes out in our industry at, at SEMA, Good Guys Columbus, and SRA Street Rod Nationals. There's always a good group of products, and it's one of the places our editors probably hit the first. And then also to see the vehicles and everything that's being built, I think SEMA as an organization has done a lot for the industry, and I think the road's going to be pretty tough going forward with all the green energy and all the different things that are being promoted around sure. our country. And you really, we really need a partner like we have at SEMA to keep on track and keep fighting. I mean, they fight every day. I can't believe we're still I, – last I heard, we're still fighting that RPM Act. Which is yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, I, I see that pop up. I mean, it's different for you. You're a California native, so you know this stuff applies a lot more. You you can't even cut your lawn without. <clears throat> We're in Chicago. This Did you want to f- talk about governors? <laughs> <laughs> we could. I mean, if you want to go, there, go ahead. I don't know. I don't think there's a win on that. That's a, that's a wash. I mean, that's each one's as bad as the other. <laughs> yeah, we'll just. No, I think. I think that, uh, I think there's a, and I see SEMA trying to promote the e electric hot rods and you guys did a chassis for a truck last year Yep. and probably have done a couple more since then. Um, I'm kind of hoping that we don't have to deal with that in my lifetime. I'd like to live a long time, but I don't, <laughs> you don't want to live that long. <laughs> I don't know that I, I'm itching to put electric motor in. I just wish it would get more to everybody would just chill out and get realistic about things and it, and embrace it for another possibility of a way to build a car. Nothing that comes out should be treated like it's going to end all things. LS wasn't treated like it blows every other motor away. Now it's done a good job of doing that, but it did it organically, but it did it organically. And I mean, I don't know anything else except this industry, the automotive industry, where it's the next thing is supposed to just wipe out every single possible competition. It's only going to be this because we've seen it for the last 50 fucking years. No matter what comes around in a few years, something comes out and bests that. I just don't. I, I like mashed potatoes, you know, but every time I eat mashed potatoes, I'm not like, I'm never eating anything again. These are the best. Like there's options out there. Like, uh, that's that's an interesting way. Everybody of needs at it. to just. You got the anti EV. You've got the pro EV, and I think everybody feels like you have to be in one of those camps. It's cool, yeah. in one way, to be like, "That's the future." Screw ice motors, you know, gas burning this, and then it's it's cool the other way to be like, "Oh fuck those things! They're, they're, they always suck. They're never going to work." There's, I think, there's just, I'm not saying we all got to get along, but just chill the fuck out a little bit about it's <laughs> it's it is an option, and it's probably a cool alternative or a, ter- a cool way to do a certain build. Yeah, but just a build that's not going to get in the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I I think my partners disagree with me on that. I, I yeah. Brian's very interested in electric vehicles, uh, electric hot rods. I think it's going to be a while before that they gain great acceptance, but I've got I can one up Phil on the Miata. I drove I a Volt. <laughs> yeah, you did drive a Volt. For I a did while. drive a Volt yeah. for a while. That you owned, or was that a rental? It was car? a lease, it, <laughs> and okay. uh, but it it had some neat options in California where you could drive in the carpool lane, and uh, save me quite a bit of time back and forth to work. But I, I could act- see how Brennan would be into electric hot rods because there's been electric hot rods at NSRA for the last fifteen <laughs> fucking years. <laughs> Those are scooters. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> Huh. But uh, sorry, interesting way, real. No, interesting I just, way of looking at it. I, I, there's just so much hate because it's it's being pushed so hard, and like mm-hmm. there's such an agenda behind it that I think it's pissing off more people. Right. Like if it just came organically, like somebody built something cool and you respect it for what it is, and a bunch of guys build stuff that's just okay. But if it takes off, great. If not, great. But quit trying to force it down everybody's yeah, throat and quit slow. trying to fight it off at the same time from the other side. I think right now it's so cost prohibitive unless you go with some, or you can find some Tesla product that's left over or something that's, sure. that you can get secondhand. It's crashed. Yeah. I think the biggest 
problem is is that it's there's a lot of smoke and mirrors right now. You know, a lot of it doesn't actually exist. You've got a tremendous amount of startups out there that you can do this, you can do that, but realistically, you know, like you said, it's it's still like grassroots hot rotting. It's going to the junkyard, getting Tesla motors, finding a battery pack, and finding somebody who really knows their shit with electronics to it's just like, to make it's like it all Bitcoin function. or NFT. It's just the cool thing to right. say. It's just nobody can but really it, explain yeah, yeah. how they're going to do it, it or how it works. <laughs> I'm going to EV something. Yeah, right. Uh, EV okay. swap. Yeah. Well, there's a when we, we go to the sand dunes. There's a really cool sand truck, and it is just unbelievably fast. But it's a yeah, Tesla. I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen that thing. It's just ripping. And that's wheelies. cool. There's no. Yeah, I mean everybody that's, that's respects that. Awesome. It, it's but cool. nobody should treat it like. That's the only way any sand truck should be built from <laughs> yeah. now on and then screw everything it's, else. It's cool until you're in Glamis, California, that's what, 60 miles from the nearest gas station. There's no electrical out there. So you've got to probably run 50 gallons of gas or diesel fuel through a generator to charge it while you're out there. <laughs> because honestly, I mean, what do you think it runs? 30 minutes at the sand drags? I guarantee it wasn't built to be conscious conscious i think it was built right for yeah, yeah right. this is fucking it was cool fa- and it, fun it's fast you know, it's just unbelievable fast. that part i can get behind it and i think it's cool just do your thing if you've got a unique take on it you can figure out the engineering you can actually get fucking parts in your hand to build it if you do it and do it well it. and i don't have any gripes right. with it like i mean you look at take a fiberglass like 32 with a 300 horse small block Chevy and a 700 R4 that the TV cable isn't quite adjusted right. Yeah, I don't know that I would really want to drive that versus something electric powered. Like I feel like you could probably make that better. Right. But granted, you could also make it better with internal combustion parts and a proper transmission. But there's so maybe that's a maybe I think I just talked myself out of it. All right. It worked out the yeah, problem and now we're yeah, 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 kind of <laughs> rationalized that one in my head. But it is amazing how quick they take off though, electric car. Yeah. Tesla. I mean, it's pretty hard to beat. I mean, yeah, if it's just pure acceleration. I mean there's just more to the driving experience for me personally. So it, just that. So if and when the Roadster Shop builds something EV, we've got to go. I actually have to go around you to Brian Brennan for Pretty once much, in yeah. my <laughs> once in my career. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there's there's room. Like Josh said, there's room for everything. Yeah, and you know, people have different interests. And I know the owner of Dutchman, the father. He was. And he's been into that for like 15, 20 years, building electric hot rods and seat. I guess it was a S10. Yeah. But he built, I think, a 32, and they were drag racing them. And I think it's like one trip down the drag strip back and back and charge it. That, at least at the time when we were talking to him. But so there's obviously interest, but I, I imagine not a lot of your customers currently. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, we get a lot of inquiries about it, and we we get uh, there, there's a handful of aftermarket companies that have us like tab chassis for their products, which we'll do. But yeah, we've got we've got a handful of them that we're actually kind of putting together, and we've got something that we've been working on for quite some time. That's kind of a total solution, but it's uh it's not as commonplace as I I think a lot of people think that it is. It's easy to talk about, not easy to do. There's not enough out there to make it a viable option yet. Right. Uh, I've got wrote down here to ask you to explain a little bit about the differences in the three magazines. I'm reading them now, and if you're a listener and you don't understand the difference between all Chevy performance, classic truck performance, and modern rotting, then maybe you don't need to be in this industry, but it's a <laughs> qu- it's a question that I'm going to ask anyway. So explain the differences between those three magazines. Well, I would say with modern rotting, we would still run trucks, but they would probably be 30s, 40s, maybe some early 50s. But really where classic truck performance takes off is from about from 47 on the Chevy side and 48 on the Ford side. And so we go clear up through the OBS trucks 
and we also go to was it 96 95 on the on the Fords um, not a lot of those being done right now the after 79 I think there's you see a few of them but I don't know that anybody's done a, a ton of those but um, and then all Chevy performance we mainly cover from 55 on up through current model year and that's not all a, Chevy right yeah right. performance oriented <laughs> I'm sorry, all Chevy. <laughs> Did I miss that one? No, I'm sorry. I was making a joke about the all Chevy performance. Yeah. Uh, and so, then the modern rotting is more... Modern rotting would be probably early 30s, and we do, don't do much on the, on the T side, but really up to whatever's cool. And so Miata. <laughs> so you're telling um, me there's a chance. There's a chance. <laughs> you know, mainly through, I mean, we do some of the muscle cars, depending on her, how they're built. They have to be built to a, a different standard, I think, than not that we don't cover any of that style of car in all Chevy performance, but, you know, we cover Fords, a lot of, I mean, we cover everything that's cool, a lot of Mopar stuff recently. So muscle cars that are built in a more of what I would call a street rod style. Sure. Not all just a, you know, I think it's kind of mixed pro touring in the street rod now because there's a lot of similarities. Yep. But I think built to a higher level, a lot of the things that you do like body modifications and that type of stuff more fits modern rodding than all Chevy performance. We're getting into the four wheel drive stuff yet in classic trucks. I've been been kicking you for a while on that, but you know we've uh, Rob and I haven't found a consistent enough group of trucks where we can run them run them monthly, and we've run a couple. Um, nobody's yelled at us. I mean, it seems like it's got, it's gone over pretty well. But I, again, we're going to build them in a, more of a performance style, not just a a lifted truck that's kind of a standard drive terrain unless it sure. was something cool that came from the factory that way we've run a couple restorations i think in in the magazine but they were a little bit more high performance oriented even when they were built so um definitely we've talked about covering a project with you and we're just waiting on you hmm. yeah we're waiting on us too i guess it's that <laughs> I know you have the one truck out there that's... Yeah, we've th got the truck, we've got the chassis, we just don't have the time. You know, that's the <laughs> problem. It's to be an issue around as here. As soon as, if we can get a customer on board with it, then it'll pay him. And we could, you know... It looks like you got five it. customers out there right now that are building square bodies that, with the uh, four wheel drive. Yeah, the square body guys, that's that's happening, that's a thing. So, and that's, uh, that's in a Survivor Series or the ones you're doing with those? That kind of, yeah organically went that way i guess that wasn't necessarily our vision from the get-go but uh it's you know realistically it's a better way to do it and all the customers that were interested in that platform were also more interested in the survivor platform so that's the way that they're going i think there's what i think there's nine total from all the yeah there's a, a, a nice painted one in the mix that's in the body shop right now that uh it's probably right. getting sprayed here uh Hopefully this week. Otherwise, yeah, all, all Survivor stuff. That's cool. Yeah. Um, being in the industry for as long as you have and, and your unique take on it, like you said, um, you're going to shows, you're getting content, specifically uh, new products and all the new cars that are being built. So you, you would be a person that would have your finger seemingly on the pulse. Has there been something that's happened in the last 30 years? Um that you or anybody else didn't see coming where it was the next year. You're like, Holy shit. That, that's a trend that we didn't expect to be, or you didn't expect it to be that big, that quick. I think the square body and OBS are probably two that you, that I mean, I've always loved those trucks. They were around when I was a kid. So, um, that was a new truck for me. Uh, I, I just didn't expect the price to go so high so quick. I, I would say on the truck side, that's really what kind of blew me away when, you know, I kept on telling everybody, oh, that was those OBS are, I mean, they were the first sport truck. We got to get, start doing that. And I've probably preached that for the last 10 years, but 
I guess just recently, everybody else found out about it. It feels like that happened overnight. Yeah, the OBS went quick. The OBS went quick. The square bodies went pretty quick too, because me and Phil were like collecting them in, you know, with with the idea of doing these legend truck builds, and we snagged a handful of really really nice trucks. And it's like all of a sudden, man, Craigslist stuff, Facebook Marketplace, and anywhere you could find them, it was like doubled. And it went, those went from <laughs> those went from being like a nine thousand dollar truck to like a twenty two thousand dollar truck for a clean survivor. And the OBS stuff's the same way. OBS is really I feel like that was in one sought week. After. Like they started out being six seven grand for a short bed that you can get anywhere, and now they're twenty five grand. Was it was either on this podcast or I heard somebody talking about it. Um, anything. That if whoever's 45 years old now, whatever they couldn't afford, whatever was new when they were 16, whatever they couldn't afford then that they really, really wanted, you know, that's what is hot or is the next thing hot. Because that's where usually that, or at least our customer base, those customers. That disposable income got now. that money where they're either scratching that first itch of, of reliving what they thought could have happened had they got that, you know, Fox body or whatever it was. And that's. Those things, it's just, it's crazy how that comes. The third gen Camaro is one I'm surprised that. Yeah. It's, that's, it's been talked about that that's the next thing coming. For 10 years. For 10 years. Yeah, I don't know if that one's coming or not. What do you think? Because it's, I've heard people, you guys have geared up and there's been, there's some suspension offerings for them. We've done a handful of like perimeter frames. Obviously it's, that car's not wildly conducive to a full chassis, but it, uh, it just doesn't seem to have really arrived. I think they will. I mean, I think like a square body or a OBS, they'll come, but I, I, it's, I don't know if they were as widely popular. I mean, there's so many trucks. I think trucks are full frame. You know, it's trucks it's are a, easy to work on. Those third gen Camaros, if, if anybody's ever worked on one, those things are a cocksucker to work on. Everything sucks about like <laughs> they do. I mean, the, the doors suck on them. Every, oh, yeah. It's not just something that your average guy can, an OBS truck, that's might as well be, you know, a, a 60s era muscle car i mean there's nothing nothing to it all of the nuts and bolts easy to get to everything's right. kind of standard there's so many weird oddities on a third gen camaro i mean from I'll tell you where you don't jack it up at anywhere other than directly yeah. under the rear <laughs> exactly <laughs> Dur- yeah and there's rocker moldings yes yeah. and a lot of that stuff's not recreated that stuff's very hard to to body work fit sure. make nice there's just a lot of things about that car that makes it difficult yeah it is a weird one because I feel like you, you look at that era, right? The Fox body Mustangs, whether you're a Ford or Chevy guy, I mean, the Fox bodies ruled the roost. I mean, those cars kicked the crap out of the, mm-hmm. any of those Camaros, the IROX, anything. And there was, there was aftermarket stuff available. Everybody was modifying those. I mean, there were Vortex superchargers or nitrous kits on almost every single one of them. Those, I feel like anybody who was a car guy in that era just didn't really want to screw with that generation of Camaro. I mean, I was a car guy and I didn't want to touch, touch him. I, I mean, I was old school, so I screwed around with a 69 Camaro, but I looked at those cars. I mean, they were kind of sort of from my era. I mean, just before me, but they just were like shitty. You know? <laughs> I guess that's, <laughs> they didn't have the I best mean, reputation. Yeah. But now, I mean, look, I do like them. They're cool. They, they look good when you put, you know, the right wheels and tires and sit them right. But I think you gotta see more know. of them built. Like yeah, Kyle's from DSC was really badass, but that's like the only that Metal Brothers that, that charcoal one that was at Columbus. Oh, yeah, the one that, that was, was across nice. from us. Yeah, that was that was really really nice. Yeah. At Columbus. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I I like the car if it's done right. But I think the fourth gens will surpass the third gens. I and think. that wasn't a great, in my opinion, wasn't one of my favorite body styles. I thought they were cool. But no. Phil had one. I did. Yeah. Well, I, I think that those that's an ultimate drifting machine. Yeah. Well, one of you were talking about Joe Road earlier, and Joe has a third gen Camaro, but he's been working on it for I don't know twenty years or something like Since that. Since it was new, I think. Right? Probably, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. He's got an E Rod motor for it. And, really? Yeah. So Joe told me he's going to make them cool. So I tend to believe Joe. Yeah. I think that's the <laughs> problem with the third gens because we run into a lot of people that are building They're working on it. a third gen. But they're, again, back to my point, those things are difficult to work on. There's nothing that's super easy to even get it to a running state of like, all right, I'll put this, 
you can't run it around without the ground effects or out the side skirts or out the thing. I mean, front bumpers are, you ever take one of the front bumpers off those yeah. things? Yeah, we, we had them come in the body shops back in the day. I even had a, a one, nightmare. I had one of the convertible conversions come oh. in that I did some work on because I didn't know at the time that they were they didn't make them in convertibles. So this thing came into the body shop to like hitting the door or something. It had a total pile. I mean, you talk about jacking one up like when it has a roof on it. <laughs> think about when you cut the roof off of it, it's not real good. Yeah. Oh. But yeah, I, I would like to do one. I don't, you know, I. To do one, to do one right. right. Yeah, yeah, and Troy's been working on that crazy Good over the great. top one for years and years, but it's so over the top, off the wall that I don't know that that will inspire people to like lower their factory high rock and put a LS or LT motor in it. Don't know. We'll see. They were pretty stiff cars to start with. I mean, getting in and out of driveways were kind of like the was it the C four Corvette. Seemed like they kind of had a. My wife had one when we were first dating. She had a C4. No, or IRA. she had a RS. Okay. With the V8. The C4. Yeah, I said. Yeah, the C4. There's something there. See, I like the C4s. So. <clears throat> ZR1. Ah, uh, ZR1. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I like that. That's a supercar, though. That'll be hopefully one day in my stable. White on white. Yeah. A stable of white on white, yeah. Late Super 80s, cars. early 90s yeah. supercars. I have none of currently, but <laughs> I keep talking did about Did they it. make the Vector in white? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they did. <laughs> the Vector, yeah, that's on that's unobtainium, though. You can't have one of those. Would you, there was one at Barrett Jackson, it, it was the biggest oh, pile of shit. Total pile ever. of shit, but it's so cool to look at like that era of car, like supercar, what they like the screen and the electronics that oh. they tried to make. Like it, but back it. then it looked like it was it was a like, future absolutely yeah. but uh if you if you make good on the white on white the white collection yeah. so to speak right and you're you're six seven cars into it and sure. you're starting to get it late would you commission a white on white crevia 100 yeah. percent. yeah absolutely i would <laughs> yeah i'd do something exotic in it though i'd probably do like i mean i might like testarossa power it you know like a <laughs> Flat V12. For rear engine. No, yeah. flat. You don't put rear. That's a, that's a supercar. I mean, it's mid-engine. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's I, I forgot. Do yeah. like a super motor of that era. Do, keep it, to, you know, you think Toyota. So? Keep yeah. Yeah, brand on brand. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. We're, yeah, we're getting <laughs> way off. Track. We went from Miatas to third gens to Previas. <laughs> I'm not even sure I know what one of those You don't are. remember the Previa? Toyota minivan. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> a like, big rounded oh, thing. It looked like a Nerf football. <laughs> yeah, it was like a sports car van. It's really something. No, there'll be a sports I know, car. I don't know. That, that's not the best description. Dude, you guys don't obviously. It was an aerodynamic van. You guys obviously <laughs> aren't into the previous scene. Google it. Like, look. Nobody no, ever says seriously. it's a sports car van. <laughs> really? Google it. <laughs> I, I'm, I am. Google it and look at what they do with previous. Well, that's right. It's a mid-engine. Yeah. Yeah, what else is mid-engine? Hmm, let's see. Uh, Ferrari F40, uh, La Ferrari. <laughs> What else? What else is mid-engine? Acura NSX. Was... I think he's reaching a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. The one with the top cut off is perfect. We can build a chassis for it. There it is. Weirder than the Subaru SVX and supercharged to boot. The Toyota Previa and Auto Week. Google Custom. There was a the JDM Previa. one on uh, eBay for a while. It was a five-speed with a turbo. Oh, there you have it. So because they customize it, that's a sports then car. it was a sports. Just carve out like 20, 30 minutes of your time. Okay. And I like get the on lifted one right there. Yeah. Poke around a little bit. It does seem like it's got a huge scene. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you those guys would be fun to hang out with. Well, that, that might be where I drive. I don't know that I want to hang out with this. <laughs> <laughs> Our McMaster car delivery driver's got one. Yeah, yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> so aside from the Previa and all those other awesome cars we talked about, what do you think's next? Where do you think the future is? I mean, you talked about the, you see the OBS stuff and the square bodies, the prices have gone through the roof. But I think you've always been 
like Josh said, your finger's always been on the pulse. You've always steered us in the right direction of where the trends are going. What do you think's next? I think for us and for modern rotting, it's the Fords seem to be an area where Fords and the and now people are even starting to modify Chrysler product, Mopars. You didn't see a lot of that. I know you guys may have done one of the first ones. Yeah. Years ago. Yeah. It just, the, the, I mean, the Mopars are beautiful body styles, just not the best mechanical or even the bodies. It's tough on the fit and finish of them. But they're, and you got to deal with Mopar owners too because they're a different breed. <laughs> they can be. <laughs> well, and I think if you look at AMD and what they've done, I mean, they reproduce most of the Mopar parts to build a body. If you can take a Michelle, um, the installation center, I don't know if you've worked with them. I've not. Um, Craig over there can take, we've done several vehicles with him, but he'll take up just nothing and make something out of it. I mean, he, we did a 69 Camaro that was just rusted to nothing. And I, I'm not sure the price. I thought it was around 15,000. He rebodied the car for us. And that's and a, you can use a standard VIN. It was that's a service they offer. A sir, not AMD, but AMD okay. made the sheet metal that we used. And, okay. And uh, we just finished with modern rotting. We're actually just starting a series on a Galaxy that they're doing, and it'll be complete, brand new, pretty much a brand new body. That company is somebody that's been been around for a while, but man, they do not sit around on their on their asses they get after it i mean all the cars you named i mean the galaxy stuff they got all the galaxy stuff right. they've got all the mopar stuff they got all the camaro it'd be easy just to be like all right yeah we got some mustang quarters and we've got camaro quarters oh we got the hoods too i mean I, they're down in georgia right yeah that, that they do everything it's it's amazing the amount of the amount of sheet metal that they that they do and we're just actually right now just finishing up in um all Chevy performance taking like a 77 and converting it to a, to like a 70. Okay. And so they make all the sheet metal kit to basically take that body and take the ugly out of it. So that's quarter panels and roof come, yeah, come up around the back window. Yeah. Otherwise the front end's interchangeable, right? I believe the front end is the, I don't think it needs a complete roof skin. I think it's just the quarter panels and Maybe some modification there for the back window. But quarters go up and form the glass. That's the like the wraparound back glass versus just the yep. inset. We have. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the article, but we did a six-part series on it, and I got to say the one you guys have downstairs, the '79, is a pretty beautiful car. <laughs> I think the '77s, you know, some of the earlier '74. Yeah, they were Could, they were kind of like the that was when child, they, they had to do that. They yeah, were the crash bumpers and all yeah, that crap. Like, and, all right, fuck it, whatever. Just get it, <laughs> get it approved. Yeah. And then they could, you know, after start, later seventies, they started being like, well, let's kind of actually make it look good. Yeah, but, seventy. Yeah, the seventy four thing was awful. Yeah, but you know, it's kind of funny when you look at it nowadays. Pretty much anything from that era starts to look good again. It does. You, know, you didn't. You didn't like it. Maybe you didn't like it in seventy three when they went to that new body style in 74 but yeah now it's a pretty damn cool car to have even without doing the yeah. sheet metal work to it yeah, the 79 i mean 10 years ago that's a car i probably would have never looked twice at and now i think that thing is so bitching i mean i love the all the z28 all the flamboyant kind of graphics from that era like that that car is cool that car's got a, it's a cool car it's got a really cool story that we'll we'll start rolling that thing out here pretty soon matter of fact i spoke with nick and sent him some photos of that car and he's wondering when you guys are going to shoot it for him oh we'd love to yeah we'd love to it's just uh (laughs) kind of on the home stretch here in the next week or so we should have it all buttoned up but that uh the owner of that car he's a guy probably about my age and that was his dad's car his dad bought it new and uh his mom they own a chain of uh, car dealerships and at some point in the 80s or 90s, the car, they sold it, car disappeared. Well, they tracked the car down. The father passed away, tracked the car down, got the car back, tried going down, you know, doing the standard kind of put a crate motor in it, put some bolt-on suspension. It never, like, you know, 
didn't do any justice. So sent it here and we gave it the full survivor treatment. It's a cool story to track that thing down like that and a yeah, family it heirloom. It, it doesn't look like a survivor. It looks No, it's yeah, it's been <laughs> fluffed up a little bit. I mean it's got it's restored enough where it's I think it's a presentable it's, car. Yeah, it's very nice. It'd be a fun one to drive for sure. Oh it is, Josh. It is. <laughs> is it seven hundred and fifty ponies. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, that car Horse is powers. You, yeah, you should take that thing out and rip it. That car's an absolute riot to drive. Looks like it. Yeah. Uh what's the coolest car you guys have featured to date? Personal favorite. I hate to say it, but it's that Corvair that Lonnie Go- Gilbertson built. Which is that? Is that the maroon one? It's kind of a, r- a red color. No, it's not the Effinator. Which I thought was also another cool car. Okay. Um, the maroon one. I'm trying to remember who built that one. That yeah, is, that's that pretty badass. Cool. And it's you know it's LS powered. It's it's really Lonnie. I believe won. I think the AMBR before. He's quite a. He's a pretty much. I believe. He's a professional builder that does it on, you know, for himself. Sure. That's a cool car. And it, we did a series on the build up on it. It's just different. I mean, I, I, I don't know that that's actually the coolest, the coolest. I'd say that for, for modern rotting was one of the cars that I. That's got a cool look. The Cor- I've always liked the Corvairs. I mean, they were like mini bubble tops, you know, they had a cool roof line. They were mini bubble tops, that's for sure. The uh, tell you what, it, it's a cool car, but the fact that you just picked a Corvair is leaning more and more hope for that Miata <laughs> to get in there. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, if you can build that Miata to resemble to, to something that like that, I, you know, we might have to lower our standards a little bit. Yeah. I think it'll bring the magazine <laughs> up a little bit. Well, if you would, if you could figure out a way to like. You know, merge the MR2, the Toyota MR2, and the Miata. Ooh, rear engine Miata or mid engine Miata? Yeah, yeah that, why you? That's something you yeah. just don't fuck with. That's <laughs> just get yourself a Miata. I mean, a, a MR2. Well, he's a Fiero guy. Oh man, you're going to be bummed. Jerry Dixie just sold his Did he really? original Fiero for five thousand dollars. Perfect. I would Jerry, love to see Jerry <laughs> Dixie. <laughs> Jerry Dixie history. That in itself is worth five thousand dollars. The the headrest must be, yeah, just be destroyed. completely stained <laughs> from that, oh. that that salad that he's got. Seeing Jerry bombing down in the Fiero, man, that would be. How's Jerry awesome. doing? I haven't, man, I haven't seen Jerry Dixie in a while. You keep in touch with him. I talked to him today. Really? Uh, yeah, we were kind of reminiscing about all the road tour cars that we built and the 08 car. I told him I was yeah. over visiting you and just how how cool it was to be able to work with that many builders to build. We built 25 of those road tour cars, and it's pretty a lot of fun getting a chance to work with everyone. Very cool. And Jerry Dixie, that's a guy who's this guy's got some balls, you know. He's logs some miles. He jumped into these cars that. All these various builders built you know, essentially for free and just <laughs> jumps behind the wheel and drives this down the road. That's What's somebody that, we like need to three, have on 3,000 miles. <laughs> you know, he's got some stories. Oh, yeah. Coming from the van background. He's and a he, van guy from the like 70s. And he did attend Woodstock. So he's got some really, he's got some quite interesting stories. I don't know what he will tell, but. How, does he remember all this? That's all right. Go, he may or may not remember. <laughs> I think he remembers a good share of them. No, that'd be a great guess. <laughs> that would be phenomenal. You think about twenty, well, the twenty fifth year. I don't think they drove the car much, but over those twenty five years of back and forth across the country, and you know, sometimes three days just bombing Pleasanton to um, Shades of the Past or whatever it was. He's got to know where all the good roadside barbecue at. Right? Well, he Any knows of the little dive. He knows. He definitely knows where the car collections are. Some pretty obscure ones as well. I bet. Uh, what's something that we can tell our audience about 
in the garage meeting. What's new? What's what's coming up? What's something we need to be on the lookout for? What's something they need to check out? This is this is the chance for a plug. Like tell everybody if you want some breaking news or whatever. I think when you really need to check out what we're doing. I think on the, on the digital side for our magazines, we've really put a huge push towards a digital magazine itself. It's easy to send out. Um, the, one of the things that we've noticed a lot of overseas orders because it's very expensive to get magazines in New Zealand and, and uh, different areas. Australia is a big, big one for us. So um, we do send out samples if you want to get on our list to see the sample issues. You can go to garagemedia.com and sign up for our newsletter. Um, but we, I think f- as far as what's new for us, er- every year, obviously, we're trying to do something better. This year, we went with a larger paper package, a wider. I think it's a full 18-inch spread now is when you open the magazine. Um, we've got a lot. We've got some projects that we've started. We've got a 55 Chevy wagon that we're building. We'll be working on a couple of early 64 Chevy trucks. Um and then also we're with um, <clears throat> all Chevy performance. We're always working on something. And I, I know we've got a couple of things coming up on an Impala. And so we'll, and some Chevelles and, and that. So I think if you're interested in Chevy muscle cars, obviously all Chevy performance.com. If you're interested in st- street rods and also pro touring style Fords and Chevys and Mopars. Uh, go to modernrotting.com and I think with classic truck performance, we're really seeing a lot of growth there as well. Um, the truck stuff seems to be doing extremely well for us. I'm sure it is for everybody who's involved. Start looking at the size of the companies you're working with in that marketplace, the restoration companies. Um, it's pretty amazing to see what's going on. So I think you'll see more as we, we want to be more involved in, in complete car builds start to finish. I don't, I think they will be a little more abbreviated than every nut and bolt, but there's some opportunities there to see something and kind of what goes into building a car. Um, With going to digital, are you able to incorporate more of that? You don't really have a page limit anymore on the, uh, the print side. Um, what else are you guys doing on the digital side to make it unique and different? I think w- one of the things that we're doing is we do transfer a lot of our information over on to in the garage com, or you could get their all Chevy performance or any of our dot coms. Um, I think we're putting more content on our website than we are adding content to each of the magazines. It kind of has to be a reproduction the way we right. we're set up. We also, we go, we go through Zinio <clears throat> and we also have a company called vertical actually puts the package together for us it's easy to scroll um so we're on two different digital websites zinio zinio.com you can get get it through there it's more of the original feel of the, of the magazine without the catch <laughs> I, get, I get mine through zinio do you mm-hmm. okay and so some people like that better i i kind of i like to read on the, my on my phone and yep. we're really well optimized with um, vertical on the phone to be able to see a good looking feature and actually read it. I have had to start getting some glasses to <laughs> your readers. <laughs> I think that has more to do with age than it does. To... <laughs> but um, so as far as our website, a lot of st- we're covering quite a few shows now um, trying to get closer and involved with some of the show organizations to be able to do some pre coverage and some, after event coverage, um, we see that really spike yep. in our readership online, and we can do it the day after the event or the day of the event, which kind of I think helps a lot. People keep are keep it fresh. Everyone wants to see exactly you know, short attention span. You want to see it now. Yeah, I think it's good. I think on our website, our our number three or four this month was um, maybe it was six, but it was the NSRA Nationals coverage. The, from modern rotting, um, there's some a lot of interest in the Tri Five coverage from the Tri Five Nationals. Cool. Good so I think you probably want to. I mean, again, we're ending. We're kind of towards the end of the season, but we will have Shades of the Past coverage. 
probably Monday or Tuesday. Um, and we'll, that's where we're headed next. Nice. We'll be giving out the Triple Crown trophies again this year. Um, being in business now for um, two, two and a half years, this will be, able, I think, the sixth year we've done it. <laughs> <laughs> Math doesn't work, but... <laughs> But yeah, it's, we're real excited about. Yeah, it's this. a great show. Sad, sad to see it leaving, or at least leaving that venue. But uh, good show. Good show. I yeah. think I'm still. You're heading down. Are you? I'm, I don't know. We haven't. Yeah, we're. I think you guys he's waiting on you. Yeah. You guys don't. If you're commit. not going. <laughs> tell me, I don't, I'll go. Like I'm waiting. On you. <laughs> You cool. know, I have a great answer. Yeah, no, I think, I think we're going to go. Think it's gonna go. A definite got so maybe. Much, so much going, it's hard to get out. But, Quite possibly, um, there's a good chance I'll yeah, definitely, definitely consider it. For sure, we're, maybe we're going. No closer than we were yeah. this morning. Uh, there's a good chance Phil's not going. I'm not going. I got a yeah. wedding. <laughs> Whose wedding? Uh, a neighbor. Neighbor's wedding. Palatine Mike's wedding. Oh, we, we didn't get an invite, did we? Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I could probably arrange that if you guys want to go. No, I'm not going to have a secondhand invite. I either get invited or I don't. Uh, Did you make it through all your questions? No, we now we reach into the standard <laughs> questions. So <laughs> some of these are standard questions. Most of these are standard questions. Uh, I do change it up and deviate a little bit. Um, but we'll start with some standard ones. The best car movie and why? Man, I'd have to say Hollywood Nights. Um, Project X was something I was involved with for several years, and I don't know if the movie was about the car necessarily, but it was a good... Yeah. A little, a little adult. So you're feeling, per, you're feeling pretty good about what they did to Project X then, as of right now? Um, I probably already commented too much <laughs> on how I feel about <laughs> electric hot rods, so... Um, but if, if it did anything, it stirred it up. Yeah, and, it uh, you know, I... I think you could have found another yellow 57 Chevy and to do that too, to do that too. But, um, we're trying to get like the thumbnail of the clickbait, you know, Tim Foss disapproves <laughs> of project X <laughs> thinks it sucks. <laughs> this is going to whoop Tony Danza's ass. <laughs> I gotta say, I feel somewhat responsible for screwing it up myself because we built a really nice car out of it before it went to Chevrolet but I did put new quarter panels on it and took those radius ones off. And I, and after watching, probably watched the movie again about six months later. Yeah. And I realized what a, what a terrible thing I did to that car. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty rough. I mean, when we, when we first yeah. got it, it was, it was pretty rough. I think I could have bought it for 10 grand at that point. Oh, imagine it's been built a half dozen times, right? I mean, since 65, it's been built and rebuilt so many times, but, uh, I kind of thought it was cool with the LS with the blower on it. Yeah. It kind of an update to, to what they did. And who owns the car now? I believe uh, discovery owns it. How did that car land in like the magazine hands? How did it become project X it went from, I mean, Hollywood nights was probably the late seventies. Yeah. It started, I believe it, the Ed Zinke's a historian on that car, but I believe it was about 65 when, modern or popular hot rodding bought it okay and they used it different engines took it to the drag strip tried it tested everything broke everything it put every kind of suspension imaginable and then when it came when it came to us after we purchased <coughs> argus at that time it was um it was in pretty bad you know pretty bad shape and so we were able to work with a restoration company close to us and they did the complete body and did, did a beautiful job on the car. And I think the car was still pretty nice. I, they put the original ramjet motor in it. I still have, actually still have the manifold. It was a Hogan sheet metal manifold before they cast it. And That's cool. So we swapped the motor out for some reason and put a, the, the one, the new one in that wasn't a prototype, but I, found a way to get the manifold so how did it end up in the movie how did they is it's, it's a pretty well-known car obviously pretty well built i mean it was supercharged big block right in that movie right right i honestly don't know how that question yeah that's something i'd like to know we have we'll have to reach out to ed zinke the historian yeah, yeah. The yeah, he's got a, <laughs> yeah, he'll, yeah. 
I'll put I'll put you in touch with him. I'll let you know all about it. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should have Ed on to talk about Project X. This, uh, this is where Josh is always trying to get that thumbnail. <laughs> oh, right. I'm going to make my own thumbnail now. Right? <laughs> you, you've heard it here first. Project X was better with the big block. Tim Foss said it sucks now <laughs> with the EV. Uh, so this next question, we asked this to a lot of guys. I'm going to I'm gonna preface it a little bit. So I'm supposed to ask you what your best SEMA story is. Now, this doesn't have to be a SEMA story. What I'm looking for is the story about somebody that's well-known in the industry, somebody that we would get a kick out of, something that maybe nobody's ever heard or very few people have heard before. We or want the person in, you're talking about doesn't want it to be heard. Yeah. We want an inside story in the industry. That's, I mean, we've got a lot of listeners that really love the, holy shit, I can't believe that happened. Um, and we deal with the, you know, cease and desist letters after. The, it's not a big deal. And you think after listening to your SEMA story that anybody cares about any other SEMA story? Do you think that there's one, was, one out there that... Nobody really gives a shit about that story. It was just degrading to me and i know that's why you like it a lot but it, <laughs> which is fine and i'm trying to think of one that i can tell you yeah, we can, you can edit tell, it out you, you can, can just run anything. through a couple of them and then we'll just pick which one you <laughs> yeah. like um no i i mean literally i'm wondering which ones i can tell <laughs> <laughs> i think one of my funniest memories of going to sema is if i don't know if you guys know fat jack I know of him. I, I don't obviously. Never Bad met Jack him. was really intimidating. He was, a, you know, he was not a big man. He had a big belly, but he wasn't a big man. And I don't know for some reason I just kind of went to the went to the HRI meeting or whatever it was, SMMA or whatever at that period of time. And you know, Fat Jack walks up to me and bumps me with his belly, and he goes, "I think you're a fucking asshole." <laughs> I looked at him and I go, well, I think you're a fucking asshole. And we were always good friends after that. But I mean, I was just, I didn't want to talk to him. You know, it was just it was so freaking intimidating. Uh, <laughs> but and what was, that his, would have been, what was his business? Um, Fat Jacks. They built hot rods. Um, okay. He was, he was kind of right around Boyd at the time. I don't know if, um, his shop was pretty close to Boyd's and then, in, the, in his final years, he was out by Lake Elsinore, had a shop out there, but he was just full of color. He was he was one of those kind of guys that you had to know, but kind of a kind of like a Barry Lobeck okay. in, in some respects. I, did you guys get a chance to meet yeah, Barry? I, I, we met Barry and knew Barry. I don't know that I would call Barry Lobeck like intimidating. I don't. <laughs> well, it was, I felt more like I wanted to sit on his lap, like it, like Grandma was gonna, you know, kind of. Tell me a story about when I was I mean, little. I guess he was a little bit outspoken like Barry, I guess. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever sell ads to Boyd? You know, I the first time I worked with Boyd was in 96, another one that at, at some points in time it could be a little intimidating. And uh, got to be pretty good friends with him. He didn't make it that much longer after that, but uh, he built us a 34 Chevy that had a roadster shop chassis on it for our road tour car. And uh, I got a chance to work pretty close to him. Um, I'm trying to think if I ever sold his company. I wouldn't have sold him an ad directly. During the time of the wheel company, I think we did get some ads from them, but um, he was kind of far removed at, at that point. But then when he start, went back and came into a smaller shop and, and towards the end, I guess I got a chance to get pretty well acquainted with him. I listened to an interview a couple weeks ago of, with Bobby Alloway talking about him and Boyd and how close they were and some of the stories of running around back and forth and stuff. And I had no idea they were that close. I knew they were friends. And stuff. They were, I mean, they'd each of them vacation in each other's house with all their families and stuff for Thanksgiving or Christmas and stuff. And it, it's some pretty cool stories of way back in the day between you know Boyd and Bobby when they were both on the come up as somebody, two guys that I, I respect a lot. Um, I think we all do on paving the way for legitimizing what we do for, sure. for a living. We just got to do a real cool 
interview with with Bobby a couple weeks. Oh, ago. that's cool because Bobby won't come on this show. So that's I'm glad you. <laughs> well, maybe I'll read your magazine to to understand. We can just all get it. copies of it. We can just yeah, play we can that read as it an on episode. Here. Yeah, Bobby won't come on here. I don't know why. Damn you Yankees! Talk to Brian and get him to pull some strings for us. Get Bobby, come on. I'll, I'll definitely talk to him. That sounded like a for sure thing. <laughs> I'm, you, you're horrible at lying. <laughs> uh, what's the first car you ever owned? The first car I bought was a 72 Ford pickup. It sits in my shed or my shop. You still have it? Still yeah. to this day. Uh, That's why you're I, always pushing us on the F100 stuff. <laughs> I, I bought it from my dad when I guess it would have been 76. And it was an old truck back then. You know, I thought it was anyway. Everybody else had the new ones. I went to school with a bunch of farmers, and the farmers all had new trucks. But I had a lot of fun with it. I sold it when I was 18 and then bought it back probably 10 years ago and got it back up and running. And uh, just there's so many things that I, I mean, it, it weathered a little bit after I sold it. Still got the paint job, still have what's left of the interior in it. But uh, I've got a 428 that I'm looking to put in it that's pretty solid. That was my first first truck I always wanted ever since I sold it. I was like, that was the dumbest thing I ever did. She got her back. And it's actual ridge. It is actually the same truck. So That's cool. It's awesome. We do chassis for those, right? Yep. Truck and a chassis. It would be. <laughs> <laughs> it would. It would be nice if you could go back in time and tell yourself any piece of advice. What time would it be, and what would you tell yourself? Well, if it had anything to do with cars, um, it would have been 1986. I sold my 912 Porsche and bought a. Uh, Bought a Toyota pickup, four wheel drive. Two, they appreciated differently. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I figured. Well done. <laughs> I, I'm kind of figuring that, based upon what I've seen, that that car is probably seventy high seventies, maybe low eighties. What's the Toyota bringing now? I think at about thirty five hundred bucks. <laughs> Actually, they're getting popular again, but <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> just not that. Maybe my, more. My Crest Five. Uh, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Um, I think it's under promise and over deliver. Yeah. No matter what you do, then they'll always be surprised. Yeah, set your expectations low. I've been doing that for 22 <laughs> years of marriage. It's no. <laughs> some words to live by right there, I'm telling you. Well, I think a, a lot of times, you know, it's really easy to get interested in something and get excited and make a lot of promises that you can't. Sure. You can't. I mean, especially in sales. Uh, it's, you know, you want to make sure that you do everybody proper, make sure that everybody gets a good it's a better deal than what you promised them. And I think that's, well, then you, you always know you're going to, you're going to do what you said you'd do at least yes, to the bare minimum. And that's, I think the, one of the biggest things throughout this industry in all aspects, no matter what, if you're selling ads, if you're publishing, publishing, whatever that is, we still haven't figured that out. Uh, you know, <laughs> doing everything that nobody else wants to do. Yeah. <laughs> building chassis, building wheels, building tires, selling, I mean, whatever it is, it's, we talk about this on the roads to success and the secrets to this and how you do something, how you do everything. It's the, one of the very simplest keys is just do what you say you're going to do, but you're also saying what you're going to do. So you get to decide at that point where you set that you expectation. Go. So don't say, you know, that's fine. I'll have it all done in an hour. If you know that you, <laughs> if it's physically impossible to have it done in an hour, just say, Hey, can I, you know, can I have that finished by the morning or, or whatever it is? Do, very simple thing. Um, and sometimes we, we, we deal this, you know, with, with managers and other guys and stuff. And you'll tell when you ask them a question, you can kind of see that look in their face instantly. And you're like, look, 
just tell me what it actually will take. You know, I'm not, this isn't a trick question. I'm not trying to set you up. Seriously, how much time do you think that, do you need to do that properly? And then you can kind of see them relax a little bit. Like, okay. I mean, it's going to take this. Just, that's good. That's it's, a good piece of advice. I like that. It is, it is tough to do. I mean, I've, you know, been in situations where, <clears throat> you know, when you, when you're in a larger company and you try to have somebody else take over those expectations and hand those, I've, I've written some credit memos in the past just because I you don't think you got what you deserve. Okay. So yeah, it's, that's very applicable to the hot rod industry. I mean, building cars, building products, it's very easy to, you know, write a check that your butt can't cash, but that's uh, that's good advice. I think for all hot rod builders, it's always better to, to deliver mm -hmm. than, because it's really easy to, like you said, get excited, overhype something, overpromise something. I've seen it happen in a lot of shops. I, I have as well. You know, I have a problem with like over promising and then having to over deliver, you know, because then you push yourself to do it just over the top. I was still thinking about those credit memos. You run a Miata <laughs> in, in modern hot rod, and you're going to be running some credit memos. That's for sure. You think so? Uh, yeah, 100%. Huh. Well, I, um, I'm not sure that it would go over well with our readership, but if you can build it to the level of, a Corvair, because I have just about died when I found out we were going to have a Corvair in the magazine, <laughs> and it was a series. I thought this is this is the worst thing that ever happened. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, still not Miata. <laughs> uh, well, that brings us to the dreaded end. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Thanks for yeah. coming. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for. It's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, we uh we learned a lot. Still. I'm going to have to Google publisher after this. <laughs> I think he just needs to lay it out there. I, and I, like an email form, just yeah, bullet, bullet points. points. Editor, I've publisher, writ writer. I've written my job description many times through the years because every new management team needs to know what you do. <laughs> okay. And it, a lot of times when the new management team comes in, publisher can mean anything. You're in charge of nothing. You're in charge of everything. You're responsible for everything, but you have no power to <laughs> <laughs> to do anything. Um, it's a very uh, fluid position. <laughs> yes. Sure. It, so I, you know, when I figured out what title I wanted, um, I thought, you know what? I've always been a publisher, so I'll just be a publisher. People can ask me, and I can tell them, you know, you're just not I th nothing now, that in. <laughs> now I'm getting, I'm getting it. You, you like to live in that vagueness. <laughs> Oh, I'm, that's, sorry, I'm a publisher. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's an editor. That's either way <laughs> below me or way above me. I have, yeah. uh, it's, as a publisher, sometimes you can overstep your boundaries, and I did with uh, Rob Fortier today. We saw this really great truck at the Street Rod Nationals about two years ago. It was, it was an ob it was, I'm sorry, it was square body, and I don't know how you guys feel about uh, step sides, but Rob and I kind of like the step sides when they sit right. So Rob says, yeah, I'm going to feature that. And somebody said that another truck magazine was going to shoot it. And so the guy reached out to me last night and I said, oh, yeah, sure. We want to feature it. And said the other thing fell through. And apparently there was another story that was a little bit longer um, that Rob had with the guy and maybe some history of not being honest and that type of thing. So Rob chewed me out today for telling him we were interested in shooting it. And I'm like, well, I'm a publisher. I can do that kind of stuff. <laughs> That's funny because Rob, I mean, just you can tell by looking at him that he'd be a really easy understanding, you know, yeah. guy. He's just such, he's just got a nice an demeanor appro about like him. An approachable. Yeah. Super approachable. Like yeah. if you saw him on like, you know, a dark alley, you'd be like, hey, I need some directions, you know. <laughs> uh, no, don't Rob's, the, a, good, Rob's yeah. a good dude, but he's definitely got a persona of. Don't let the tattoos fool you. Is he a softie? Nah, he's a he's a great guy. I love working with Rob. I mean, I love working with Brian Brennan and and uh, Nick. I've got a a great team of editors to work with. That's and sometimes I'm a publisher. Yeah, let's see. They, <laughs> they've all got actual titles, and you know what they do. Uh, thanks again to Tim Foss. Uh, remember, you can check out In the Garage Media's magazines by visiting their websites at inthegaragemedia.com. 
All right, it's time for the glove box where we tell you about some of the cool new gear, guns, EDC shit, whiskey, and other stuff we're into. This in the glove box segment is brought to you by none other than Blade HQ. Whether you're into cars, motorcycles, hunting, fishing, grilling, or any number of things, you've got the tools that you swear by. Have you ever noticed that the tool that you swear by is a knife? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've, I've always noticed that. I was doing a little painting of an extra bedroom this weekend. What do you know? I needed a knife. I had to pop off a little plug switch plate cover. Yeah. Took the screws out. It was stuck. Painted to the wall. So Popped out my knife. Popped it off. The you know tool for any job, typically, more often than not, it is a knife. So you gave Wyatt his first pocket knife, right? The sure little, did. What, did. what was it? The, it was an OTF? Yep. What was it? A boker. Boker. Right? Yes. Yeah, a little mini, but mini you, boker. But you doled it down on the pavement. Just a little, yeah. Before giving it to him. Well, that is that's, a pro- a, that's a problem. And here's why it's a problem. Because he's doing paper tests. Well, basically, he's constantly gripping skateboards. And then he takes his extra grip tape and he grips his like little fingerboard decks and makes like these cool little, but that blade will not cut it. So I go downstairs the other day and there are razor blades mm. on the floor that he's now found that a razor blade gets the job done better, well, which I is a much more, I'd, that's a much more dangerous. I didn't think I'd doled it down that much. Yeah. Obviously it did. So we got to sharpen that sucker back up. Okay. So maybe it he's, will, Work Probably for, shown maturity enough to have a sharp uh, one. Absolutely. Uh, if you don't have the knife that you swear by, get one. Go to bladehq.com slash oil and whiskey and shop their selection of knives. Sounds like Phil probably needs to hop on Blade HQ and I do. Get some more knives. <laughs> I think we all do. I I'm at the point right now where I've got predominantly my going out knives left which periodically I'll bring one in, but I've got a few very nice knives. I just, I worry that I'm a little reckless that I don't know that I want to carry it to work. You know, I'll go opening a box or cutting something or prying with it. So I've been holding back a little bit on those. So yeah, I need some more daily drivers. Yeah, it's time to, time to refresh. Up the collection. Yep. yep. But I'll tell you what, this. What do you have? That little guy right there for a daily driver been a while since i've carried that that is the crkt ceo which we've talked about several times that is just a phenomenal phenomenal knife so much fun the way that that flipper functions sleek sexy slim it's got a lot going for it all same thing could be said for you yeah you could say that I appreciate People that. People have said hey, that. I appreciate that, Josh. That means a lot to me. Sexy, huh? Sleek, a little weird. Sleek and yeah, slim was where I was yeah. mainly that focused got a little on. awkward. But yeah, good good action on that. Great, Great price, price point. point. It is. Great price Damn. point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How much are they? Like 50 bucks, yeah, something it's, like that? It's less than $60. For a, like you said, it's, and they've got so many different colorways too and scales. Um, great action. But that's something that it's got... I don't know how to say this without sounding stupid. It's got just the way it's made has a presence for knife guys or non-knife guys. Like you said, a going out knife. You yeah. pull that out. You it, could dress that up or dress it yeah, down. It shows that you like nice things. You can tell. That's when if you're knife cool. shop, if you're on Blade HQ, you're buying some stuff, you can afford to come off an additional whatever it is, 40, 50 bucks. Just throw that on there. Yep. That's Get yourself that CEO. A little icing on the cake. Uh, Go ahead. Say, what are you rocking, Josh? Give uh, you a little intro. I am rocking. Uh, the last couple weeks have gone to something new. I went back to the Runt, ProTech Runt um, in the all black. It's great action. It's a small little knife. It was a little thicker than I wanted it to be when I first got it, but I've, I've started carrying it more, and you don't really notice that it's there. It's so small. It's got great power, great action. It's got a little too much power, in my opinion. I think I go flying across the room and stab somebody. Yeah. <laughs> hey, if you if you, you got to hold on to it, it. Yeah, yeah, you got to grab hold of it. You don't want it to get out of your hands. <laughs> grab hold of it now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, these are cool. The Protec stuff's awesome. I think that's a great size knife. But tonight, I have I went through the archives and I have grabbed a new one that I'm going to put in the rotation. Yeah. This is the Kershaw Launch 11. Um, You're gonna launch that one 
right into the collection, huh? Right into the Launch rotation. it right there. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I tell you, it's got it's got some good good yank too, and it's but it's very simple, very minimalistic. Uh, little stone wash blade, uh, little bronze bushing there on the outside. It's it's a, it's a good look. It's one of Kershaw's newer designs, and uh, a little a, again a little nicer. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna we're gonna put that in the rotation and see how it how it does. I like that. I like the little American flag engraved on the blade too. Yeah, a nice the touch. Little U.S. of A. Carrying carrying knives, not that we're knife <clears throat> experts, but doing this as much as we've been doing it as of late this last year, you start noticing a lot of things about the knife. You can have a knife that looks really cool. The action sucks or the, the depth of the pocket clip. Yeah, the depth of the pocket clip, the oh. thickness, and then some of the way that the machining is done on the outside. I am telling you, if it's not, I've destroyed some pants in just a week or two yeah. of carry yeah. in the pocket. Because yeah, of the way yeah, you get her hung up on there, yeah, and uh, there's some that don't do that. So there's a lot, there's a lot to this knife game. Um, I'm sure we're not doing any of this justice because <laughs> we don't know what we're talking about. But there really is when you start carrying them. The depth of the pocket clip is is a huge deal. Something that you know, as obviously as a novice, and I just liked knives prior to this. Um, hey, you don't know until you get a bad one, and then you're like, ah, oh, this thing's awkward. It's sitting way up high. It's jabbing me in the love yeah. handle when you sit down. But uh, I think this one's got a lot of things going for it, so we're gonna we're gonna try that out. What do you have, Phil? Boring. I'm rocking my standard uh, same old Benchmade. We need to engrave that with a uh, PGS on the side. I tried to buy another one, but it uh, the plastic uh, G10 grip version with the serrated blade has been discontinued. I wanted to get another one just so I had it in in stock for future. You can't go to the smooth blade. No, I gotta have a serrated blade for a daily carry. So no, you, it's just so much more useful. If you ever got to get through like a uh, wire tie or something like kids' toys and shit, when you like Christmas time, if you're yeah. sitting there and you don't have a serrated blade in your I pocket, I don't ever you're, use you're a serrated fucked. blade for that. Try cutting through a zip tie yeah, with yeah, a I straight mean, blade. You just you get it in there and you go. Yeah, it takes it takes more effort. You have to it be careful. Be a, yeah, it can yeah, be a little bit dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Serration is nice. It's just like perfectly broken in now. It is. It is. Um, I was expecting more. I mean, you knew we were doing a podcast tonight, so I thought you would try and show out a little bit. But this says that you really do like this night it's that much. In my pocket, six days a week, if not more. I've had a hard time finding something that compares to it. So I got a Civivi Elementum. I got to break that one back out. That was a good one for Carrie. What are we drinking? Bourbon whiskey. Yeah, buddy. Yep. Go the Old Elk Blended Bourbon Whiskey. Blended straight bourbon whiskey. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say everything that we've had from Old Elk so far has been very, very good. They haven't missed yet. Um, nope. I still think the Weeded is my favorite. Um, this one's not that far off, though. And this is like their entry-level blended. I think it's like a $45, $50 bottle. Um Super drinkable, good flavor, smooth. I yeah, like everything about it. I think this would be a a pretty staple daily drinker. <laughs> yeah, I think that's something you could reach for, like a Buffalo Trace, something like that. Good, good stuff. Where are you going, Josh? Are you getting getting the whiskey list? Yeah, yeah the old whiskey list, eh? What's the proof on that? Because it drinks pretty easy. I think it's on the lower side. Eighty-eight proof. Yeah, yeah, which is good. I had a couple glasses of that tonight, and I'm still clear-headed and functioning, unlike <laughs> the Infinity Blend Old Elk that we had on a yeah, few, that fucked both of you guys. A few up. podcasts ago, that I just kind of don't really remember the second half of the podcast, but I do remember it being good. Just a little bit of a burner, a little stiff, but this is this is solid. Like you said, I'd I'd say it's close to their weeded, not quite there, but definitely a buy it, recommend it, grab it. You can usually find that just about anywhere. Yeah, it's good you can find one that you can drink, not feel guilty about killing it, and actually enjoy it while doing drinking. so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sometimes when you're reaching, you know you're going to be drinking like fairly heavily that evening. You got some buddies over. You're going to be really running through some whiskey. You you don't necessarily want to reach for the top shelf stuff, but you also don't want to reach for the bottom shelf. You want to have something that's just like you know, kind of nice. Some people do. 
uh, this just kind of this it depends confirms. on the it depends on the friends you know it yeah. depends on who's coming over right it, this confirms we because we talked about this for a while this was we wanted to go there you know that's not bottom shelf but that's old elk that's their entry level bottom shelf uh, entry level deal and we wanted to try this to see if how it matched up with the rest of them this solidifies the fact that if you see old elk just try it and get it because we haven't had a bad one this puts this brand way up the list for me because it is that a little bit unique because it's not it's not so mainstream you know which yeah. is a good thing and a bad thing you're still feeling like you're a little bit of a connoisseur you feel like you've got something a little it. special and it tastes really damn good and like you said i mean you can do this if you know you're going to kill a bottle the night and you know that's going to be great and then let's face it after after four or five glasses in you know yeah, you can't taste it doesn't really matter what you're drinking anyway so like roll uh but this is this is old elk across the board, no bullshit. I mean, obviously we're not sponsored by them. This is, you know, not a, a paid ad. Old elk hits way above its weight limit. Absolutely. For sure. Yep. And get the gift pack too, because then you get the deer head. The yeah, that's why I bought this one. That was, the, the, that was the Christmas that. package. Did we show the... that? Or should we snag, snag that yeah. thing, Josh? Well, yeah, I don't know if we showed that off, but that is a great little. It's the best pour, pour out with... there. Yeah. So I bought this at uh, Garfield just because it was the Christmas package and came with a gold uh, elk's head uh, as the pourer, and then we switched the elk's head over to the Infinity bottle. But that alone was worth it, and the bourbon's pretty damn good too. Yeah. The uh, now we come time for the rating and review. What are we giving it? I'm gonna go seven and a quarter. Hmm. Okay. Is that high? Low? No, I don't think it was high. I was wondering. I was trying to get a baseline of, you know, where we're at. What did we drink last, Josh? Uh, we drank Clyde Mays. And we we hit that pretty. That was up there, wasn't it? We were up in the eights with that, weren't we? Uh, no. No. Uh, Phil Wait. gave it a seven. You gave it a seven point three. I gave it okay. a seven zero. Oh. Now I apologize. Right above that, the uh, ninety two proof Clyde Mays straight bourbon. Uh, was seven seven five for Phil, eight zero oh for Jeremy, and eight one for me. Okay. So yeah, the, so I do remember things. I, I yeah, I apologize. I had two. We had two Clyde mazes there. Seven and a quarter. I'm, it's good. I'm a, I'm gonna bump it up a little from that as at a seven four. Seven oh, four for yeah. Jeremy. I like it. Doesn't. It's not like anything unbelievable, but it's something you can absolutely drink and enjoy all night long. I'm going to go better than Buffalo Trace, not as good as Weller Special Reserve. That's probably a good good way to classify it. I'm going to give it a 7.3. I, the, that low proof works with this flavor profile. I'd like to have a little more oomph, maybe a little more heat. I don't know. Something a little bit more, not, not bad at all. Sure, and that kick you in the chest while you take a drink. Oh, you could try that. Yeah, that works. So I'm going seven <laughs> three. Mule kick. You got to take a sip. All right, seven point two five seven four and a seven three for the old elk straight blended. We what did we? Here. What did we hit our? Go back and look at the other old elks. Uh, the old elk we did. We never rated. Mm. Night must have got away from us. Yep. yep. The this is the double wheat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, other old elk we did not rate. This is the first old elk that we've rated on air. So we'll have to go back to the weed. We do a side by side from the weeded double wheat. Yeah. I've got a sherry cask at home. We might have to do just a, a tasting episode. We might have to run the old elks, give them some reviews, cleanse the palate a little, and run some other stuff. We're going to be fucked. Uh, <laughs> well, we can just the do, problem is, just a little, a little taster. taster yeah. As we're getting towards the end of this season, I guess as you'd call it, we are left with an onslaught of bottles that are half drank. I don't know, three quarters of the way gone. We're going to have to go through the 37 or whatever, 40 bottles. And we're going to have to, I guess, do a half ounce out of each one. We're going to have to do an infinity, infinity bottle. bottle. Uh, we're going to have to do the season one oil and whiskey podcast infinity bottle. I think that'd be cool. That would be. Yeah, we. what if we, we've... I mean, we've killed a f fair share of bottles. Yeah, we'll have to. That are dead and gone. Try. We'll have to get another one of those to do a pour. I got the list right here. 
then maybe right. auction that bottle off. Well, we could break it down into like one Little ounce tasters. or two ounce tasters. It might just be absolutely horrible. Who knows? I started an Infinity Blend at home years ago, and I just totally lost sight of it. I think it's like maybe two ounces. Really? Yeah. A I've, beautiful decanter. I yeah, I got one too. Do you, is it a bourbon decanter? No, that one, I'm saving that for, I don't know what I'm saving, I'm just looking at it. You're saving it just in Josh's en- house? Yeah, just enjoying it. <laughs> no, no he, Josh he actually gift, got that. Josh you gifted, gifted it back to him. Oh, yeah, his birthday. That. Yeah. yeah. We've, we've talked about some great old elk whiskey. Uh, we do have plans for some blind taste testing coming up, and we are going to be mixing it in a little still house. Actually uh, broke out some still house over the weekend. Did you? Yeah, to show a to show a fine gentleman how good that the black bourbon actually was. It's a I get the the stainless can. I think it's fucking awesome. The marketing is great and all that stuff. But to a whiskey connoisseur, if you're going to pull that out, it's it's not the greatest presentation to say, "Hey, it's really good." However, once they taste it, it's it's one of those oh, like, yeah. "Oh, shit, this stuff is good." Is, yeah. I mean, I've got plenty of hundred dollar plus bottles that are not very good in comparison to that. No, well, hats off to Stillhouse for actually worrying about what it tasted like. So that's, that is important. That's, I mean, it, it, if it's something you're key. drinking, you know, yeah. that is kind of key. Yeah, a lot of people don't, though. <laughs> uh, all right, next up, it's Roadster Shop Hall of Fame. This segment is where we take a few minutes to talk about some of our most favorite vehicle builds, the iconic builds or builds that have a cool story or something that was maybe instrumental or a turning point in the business. This week, we have, what do we have, Phil? We have our uh, 1970 C10. So this one uh, was a little bit of everything. I think pretty pivotal pretty pivotal in uh, the Roadster shop. Right there and it is. And something that. that we had a whole lot of fun with. Um, and uh, yeah, did a lot for the company. So started when we wanted to uh, build the first Fast track chassis, get something on the road quickly that we can use as a kind of test mule R&D vehicle. So we found this really nice uh, long bed out of Arizona that I think we paid like 3500 bucks for. Yeah. Um, Didn't they, was that a Kenny Davis deal, I feel like? No, the other one oh, was. The, the Craftsman the, yeah, truck was. Right. Yeah, so um, then when Dynacorn made the complete short bed, so we were able to take the long bed, do the conversion without the whole new school trend of cutting it up and having the scars left there. Uh, we just went with a E-coated bed on it, and we kind of got down and dirty to get it on the road quick. Um, designed the chassis, left that in bare metal for a while. Yeah, it was just um, as quick as we could get that thing on the road. Yeah, threw a little LS2 in it, I believe, uh, initially, and then just went out and kind of pounded on it, and it had several different uh, iterations over its lifetime. Um Blew it back apart, powder coated it, painted everything on the uh, truck. Um, wanted to keep it kind of original-ish looking, so it wasn't like some crazy modern pro touring looking vehicle. Um, then we kind of took it out, started doing a lot of the autocross stuff with it, and it was doing incredibly well. So we had to ditch the old torque thrust, um, change the seats up to get some more bolster, and then we reached out to the guys at Forge Line and got a set of, uh, that's the RB3s. RB3, uh, 19 by 12s and 20 by 12s, 345s on all four corners. Then got with, uh, on all four corners, you say? All what? four. That's right. Yep, that's the front and the back, the left and the right. Um, yeah, four corners. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm clarifying that you weren't sure, so I wanted to just make sure. Uh, got with the guys from Turnkey Engine Supply out in uh, Oceanside to build us a badass RHS tall deck LS motor that was, was Colby that, and Corey. Yep, we were kind of forced into that though because what happened with the motor before oh, that? I blew it up. <laughs> <laughs> we found the limitations on uh, how much nitrous an LS two will take on the Just back. Spray that thing. Yeah, on yeah, the geez. back <laughs> on the back straight at Road America. So the product, the truck was doing so well. Uh, Phil was ripping this thing at like every autocross, crushing it, like dominating, right? Well, we're getting ready to go to, it was Road America, and we're looking at the track. He's ran out at Road America before. We're like, dude, we're like, we're going to get crushed on the straightaways. Like, we just can't. The thing doesn't have any power, right? It was like 
was like 400 horse yeah, something. something. Yeah. So we paint up a nitrous bottle, you know, matching hugger orange or whatever that was, stick it in the back, get a little, you know, auger toggle on the deal dash. into the intake and just, uh, yeah, let it rip. You figure what the hell, right? It's going to. Yeah. It was a wide open What's throttle switch. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> yeah. The, so the bearings, you know, and the crank bearings don't really like that a lot when you are running it for any length of time. So, yeah. Over. Over. Grenaded that. Yeah. So then we went with the big bullet and had turnkey build this uh, nasty RHS tall deck uh, LS motor. I was like 720, 730 horse fuel cell in the trunk, um, big wheels and tires on it. My boy Dustin riding shotgun. Yeah. Uh, done messed up his uh, his jeans there after that ride, I think. Probably. Um, and then we kind of took it out and set the uh, the muscle car world on there's its ear. Stig, Stig driving it right there. I look good in that yeah, helmet, you do, don't you I? Look pretty badass. You, you know, there's something about you, Phil, that you, when you Got put a full that visor down, the visor looks, down. You look good. <laughs> if you could put that helmet on doing the podcast, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Should I do that? Yeah. Nah. You wouldn't be able to. Oh no, I got a mic in there, so we can just broadcast yeah. it through that. Yeah. So yeah, then got invited out to a popular hot riding magazine. Did the muscle car shootout, and we didn't have a muscle car at the time. Actually, we did, but it was too nice and didn't want to beat on the customer's car. So we brought this truck out and beat all of the other uh, suspension manufacturers in their badass muscle cars with our stock looking pickup truck. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with it. This thing, the evolution of this truck is crazy. To see, you forget about all this, but looking back at it, to see that you know, needed more horsepower, I'd upgrade the motor. Fuel system's lacking. Okay, we're going to a fuel cell. It just one thing after another. And we went from a five speed to a six speed. Pulled the seats out, rebolstered yeah. them, put a harness in. Yeah, it turned into a race truck this pretty is, quick. This is definitely an instance where you need to be watching the episode on YouTube so you can see us go through the pictures. I do have a question. This one here, is this for when it doesn't crank? Everybody knows why. Um, <laughs> The Optima's equipped battery. Optima battery is equipped. Oh, it, yeah, no, it, it's like yeah, a, no, no, no. everyone's like, oh shit, I see why. I have. Yeah, you got to you got to charge it off of another one to trick the charger into knowing that it's that's just dead. a shot at Optima batteries. In <laughs> <'Cause, laughs> case anyone suck. couldn't read between the lines, because they suck. Uh, Thanks for that. Uh, the company is yep. great. It's just the batteries that <laughs> are not really good, um, or at all. Then fuel cell. I will say this truck. Uh, Dry sump in the bed. I I was had the pleasure of taking a ride in it, I think at Indy. Um, but more importantly, my wife did. Really? Uh, yeah. My wife took a ride with Phil uh, around the autocross track. Um, that that truck was, I don't know, something about did, being in the truck. How did that make her feel? She rode in the middle for some reason. I don't understand hmm. why that, yeah, sitting up on the console. Yeah, didn't, didn't <laughs> want to slide out the window on the other side. The... Uh, it's something weird about being in a truck that large of a cab and you can kind of see yeah. out better than you can in some muscle cars. The, you can see the hood, the shape of the truck going your that seating fast, position. everything the, around the, the it. The proximity like, of your ass to the ground in it. It's, yeah. it's a little surreal when you're it's that speed. Wow. Especially when you're diving off into a corner and you're thinking you're in a pickup truck. And you're yeah, no guy, hey, fucking dude, you, way. You're going like pretty fast. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was it logged a ton of miles, and that had an absolute blast in that truck. That had that tiny little clutch in it. The thing would rev up like yeah, that sounded. It was ridiculous. nasty. Yeah, the truck's still it, around somewhere too, isn't it? It again, it continued to evolve or devolve. Devolve. Yeah, it, it, it made it a little bit more civilized because it wasn't drivable it was on the rowdy. street at that point. It was it was nasty. It was kind of an all out, yeah, very rowdy. So somebody's got it, and I know they swapped the motor out to. Yeah, we put an LS3 like, in it. Is that what we did? Yeah, because oh, we right, ended right, up putting that right. motor in the Colorado. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We made it a little bit more street friendly and then uh, sent yeah, it on the way. Looks, looks good, though. Yeah, it's mean. It wasn't really, again, like one of those exercises in fit and finish. Cool color, cool trim, wham, bam, paint job. And uh, the thing was just kind of all about just kicking ass. Sounded wicked. I always Sounded remember amazing. The, the sound of that thing pulling out of the shop and Phil just like, Quarter mile passes every time it left the shop, and you just see it disappear over the hill. Yeah, just, I just love that heel toe downshift, like third to second of the stop yeah. legs. It would just wax so quick and rev up. And it's always funny Phil's level of uh, restraint, or that he's portray that he's putting on to us all the time, right? Just 
see where you hey, go with this careful, one. Careful, <laughs> careful, you know, like I can't even ask for like extra ranch at a restaurant. Hey, like, seriously, they brought you enough ranch. Like it's it's, <laughs> when is that it's very it's always very restrained. But when it comes to like motorsports speed on an, on the road, there is no restraint when it comes to Phil's world. Maybe it's just mm. all of the Miata racing or whatever. It's a, it's yeah, in, it's all from that. It's in the blood. But there's there is no time when it's I always say what's the worst that can happen. That's that's kind of our thing. What's sure. the worst that can happen? Phil always has a reason and tells us what the worst is that could happen for any decision we're making. But it, when it comes to speed and racing and him behind the wheel, he's balls, balls, balls out. Balls to the wall. Yeah. That's a little a more compliment. calculated. I step it up. I don't just go all in. You got to kind of find the limit, work up there. I got you. It was, it was a compliment. Some, thank you. I'm saying that's your time. That was your time. That's my time to shine. Always your time to shine when it gets behind the wheel of something. But seriously, dude, take it easy with the fucking ranch, right? This like, <laughs> I don't even order ranch. It was just a thing I could come up with. Uh, that yeah, solid one for the Hall of Fame. One yep, of my favorites. Absolutely, it was a good one. This is a uh, one that you're gonna have to watch on YouTube if you want to see the truck that we're talking about. There's some good videos. Versus just the silence. There's yeah. some good videos of that truck too on our YouTube page. If you dig through there, it's been gone a while, so they're back in the archives. Yeah, they're back. They're a little ways, but yeah, cool truck. Thank you to everybody. This was a really good one. This was great. It was a good one. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Oil and Whiskey with the Roadster Shop and Ironclad Original. If you like the show, what do you do? Smash that like button. Is that Comment what you do? down below. Both of those are good. Okay. Those, <laughs> both of those are acceptable. <laughs> yes. That's what I was wanting. That's All the right. excitement. Uh, thanks again to our guest, Tim Foss. We'll see you again next week. Welcome to Oil & Whiskey, an Ironclad original. I am Josh Henning. I'm Phil Gerber. I'm Jeremy Gerber. 